Hello, folks. Thank you again all for coming. For those who came in since the last time I opened my mouth, uh, if you want to speak in the public part of tonight's meeting, there are these little white slips up there at the front you need to fill out. Uh, and uh, planning and zoning staff has asked that everyone who's here uh, who's interested should fill out the attendance form that's up there. We don't typically do this for the ELOC meeting, but ZBA does this. And the uh, reason is that if there's upcoming meetings and there's literature or agendas to be distributed, you're on the, the list. Uh, so they can reach out to you so you know when the next meeting is. So the attendance sheet is also by the door. And I'll, I'll do one more call for these later on. But if you wanted to speak, fill one of these out and bring it up to the front. And we'll, we'll start in a minute or two. Thank you very much. Okay, it is 6.32. I want to thank everyone for coming tonight, both on ZBA and ELOC and everyone in attendance. This is a moderately historical moment. I think it's been about 50 years since there was a joint meeting between the Zoning Board of Appeals and ELOC. So you're a little part of history tonight. Uh, and again, I want to thank everyone who has been here. Jen, you don't have to fill one of these up. Okay. Um, and so I am going to call the uh, Environment Land Use Committee meeting to order. And I turn it over to you, Ryan. Thank you, kind sir. Um, I have 1834, and the ZBA is going to be called to order. Will the clerk please call the roll? Okay, we'll do ELOC first, and then we will do ZBA. So, Mary for ELOC. Hortado. King. Here. Patterson. Here. Paul. Store. Present. Esri. Here. Thorsland. Here. For ZBA, Mr. Anderson. Present. Mr. Bates. Here. Mr. Elwell. Present. Mr. Herbert. Here. Mr. Randall. Here. Mr. Roberts. Here. And Mr. Wood. Here. <clears throat> Do I have a motion to to suspend the ZBA bylaws for this meeting? So moved. Thank you, Mr. Wood. Do I have a second? Thank you, Mr. Roberts. Voice vote. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, I would entertain a motion now to approve the agenda for tonight. Moved by Aaron, second by Mary. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed? Hearing none, the agenda is approved. Uh, before we start public participation, I'd like to make another motion to allow the members of the ZBA to participate as if they were board members, county board members, which means they're allowed to speak when we get to discussion. Ordinarily, that doesn't happen. And uh, we do have other members of the county board here, too. So if one of the uh, motion by Chris and a second, second by Kyle, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed? All right, good. I have a lot of slips tonight, so I anticipate later on we will extend the duration of public participation beyond an hour because I know some of you people have come tonight and want to have a chance to talk. 
and we're going to do everything we can to get everybody in. Uh, the time limit of five minutes is still in effect. I would also ask people, if you come up and you agree with the person before you and you support what they say, you can say that and then you can add your unique parts. We are discussing three things tonight, uh, and they are related. We're not discussing about height and lighting. We're discussing the minimum separation, which is suggested to be 3250, the noise limits of 39 dBA, and the infrasound limits of 80 uh, dBC. So uh, if you can keep to those topics, that would be helpful. Uh, and this will give everyone a chance to participate tonight. And I, again, I appreciate that. So with that, I'm going to open public participation. And I have Rebecca Kammerer. If you want to come up. Rebecca? There you are. If you push the little face on the microphone until it stays red, then you're live. And if you could speak clearly into it, that would be helpful. It's right down there in the center bottom. You're on. Thank you very much. Hi. Good evening. My name is Dr. Rebecca Kammerer. My address is 1782 County Road, 300 North in Philo. I own a veterinary practice in Sydney, which provides on-farm services in Champaign, Vermilion, and Douglas Counties. As you can tell from my address, I live three miles from the Douglas County line and a few more miles from the Harvest Ridge installation. I have several friends and clients who have felt the effects of these turbines, and I've heard several anecdotes about their dealings with the building company. I think that many of us in this room have made a point to come to all of these meetings because we have seen what happened in Douglas County. It is why we are asking for larger setbacks, limited tower height, and lower noise limits. These would all be accomplished by the ZBA's recommendation, which I fully support. Um, while I was preparing these notes, a phrase came to mind. When someone shows you who they are, believe them. The Harvest Ridge Project has shown us many things about who wind companies are. They use the rural roads with the promise of improving them, only to leave them almost unusable, and only return to repair them after a lawsuit. Their giant equipment crushes underground tile, leaving soil drainage severely compromised. It's been two years post-completion, and farmers are still dealing with flooding fields that had zero drainage issues before the wind came. And probably the most offensive is their business or sales tactics. They offer whatever it takes, usually large sums of money, to divide and conquer the communities they build in. They pit neighbor against neighbor, landlord against tenant, and sometimes family member against family member. This is what they have shown us, and those of us who have invested our time to be here, meeting after meeting, believe them. They have also shown us their agenda, money. Out of all the meetings concerning the wind ordinance before tonight, there is when one proponent of the wind industry come forward to speak, a paid wind employee. I'd like to offer a rebuttal to some of his speaking points that he made at the meeting on June 16th. He compared our county to McLean County, how many installations, new projects were being built there. Sounds like a slippery slope to me. Once wind comes in, they will be everywhere. I know I don't wanna see that, especially sin since there seems to be minimal county oversight of these projects or repercussions when the residents are being negatively affected. He also said wind contributes millions of dollars to the tax base. Agriculture already contributes millions to this county's economy. In 2019, agriculture and its related industries generated approximately $1.5 billion. It supported 6,304 jobs, which paid over $370 million in household income. Agriculture contributes plenty to this county, and we are asking that the wind industry not be allowed to disrupt our lives, which is farming. He made a point about freedom to farm. How? If ZBA's recommendations were instituted, a farmer's freedom to farm would be restricted because he couldn't have a turbine in, on his ground to make profit. Farming is defined in the Oxford Dictionary as the activity or business of growing crops or raising livestock, living organisms. Wind is not a living thing. Turbines are definitely not. They have nothing to do with farming or anyone's right to farm. They are industrial installations. 
there have been exactly zero farmers come to these meetings asking them to protect their right to farm using turbines. In closing, I know there are members of this committee who would love to see wind come into the county. Then find a way to protect those of us that will be directly impacted. That starts with strict county oversight, with enforced penalties, setbacks of 3,250 feet, limited tower heights, lower sound limits. I'll leave you with a quote from Thomas Jefferson, one of our founding fathers. Agriculture is our wisest pursuit because it will, end, it will in the end contribute the most to real wealth, good morals, and happiness. Thanks for your attention. Thank you. I now have Josh Hartke. Good evening, Mr. Chairman and both boards. Thank you for letting everybody talk to you tonight. Uh, I'm Josh Hartke from Champaign. Um, I know that everybody has probably seen the headlines recently about the potential for brownouts in downstate Illinois. Uh, it's a report out of MISO, the group that runs our grid that we're all connected to. It's basically the idea that we don't have enough generation close to where everybody's using it. And when we get to high usage points, like really hot summers, when everybody turns on their AC, you're going to have brownouts. And, and those may or may not happen, but the concern is whether there's enough energy on the grid. Uh, the ordinance that you're considering in front of you tonight will effectively ban any wind development in Champaign County. People can cut it any way they want, but it, it does. That, that they know, these are folks who are not necessarily for safe wind siting, they're for no wind siting, and, and that's their right to be that way. But just to be clear, that that's what the ordinance in front of you is doing. Um, you know, so we need this energy, right? And I grew up on a farm in a rural area down in Effingham County. Uh, it was far less developed than Champaign County. Um, we, but still, I grew up within a quarter mile of two different uh, cattle feeding operations, uh, a couple of different hog operations. Uh, I can guarantee you, having been around wind turbines a lot, I would have rather had wind turbines around me than those, guys, those things even on a cold day. But hey, that's what, that's what we lived with. We live within sight of a pretty large coal plant down there. Uh, and nearby there was a railroad track about a quarter mile away that woke us up multiple nights because it was hauling coal to that plant, very heavy loads. Um, my kind of point being that you know people, even in rural areas, do live within development and, and things that are necessary to, to move our communities forward. Uh, supply and much needed energy resource. I know that when I came to Champaign County and I served on this board, I represented a part of Champaign and that included the Fifth and Hill area of this community, of Champaign. An area where folks are still to this day, many years after mediation, are living with uh, toxic chemicals coming out in their basements because they lived near a plant that supplied energy to this community for many, many, many years. Uh, the cancers, things like that, that are, that are documented and, and proven came out of that community. Um, you know, so in my mind, asking people to live within a quarter mile of a wind turbine that's built on a plot of ground that the person who owns it wants it to be built there, uh, I, I don't think that's asking too much to, to supply this energy. I know there's folks going to talk a little later about the specifics on, on the dangers of wind, which are really highly overestimated in, in what you're talking, in what you're looking at. Um, so I'm not really going to go into that because their studies are really recent. They have a lot of specialists that, that actually study that area of, of, of both sound and health um, that can talk to you more about, you know, just how safe ultimately wind is. I also want to add that wind is currently the most affordable electrical uh, supply on the, on the market. Um, so when you worry about increasing the cost of, uh, and people can laugh, but it's because there's no fuel costs. Folks, the, the money, the numbers are there. There's a reason companies are throwing billions of dollars into these yeah, developments. If you could not interrupt the speaker. Uh, there's a reason large companies are throwing billions of dollars into these developments, because it is the most efficient way to produce electricity these days. Uh, so, so I ask that the, the committee remember the bigger picture as they look at this. Yes, they should be safely cited, there's no doubt. Uh, a good solid wind company is going to want them safely sited. Um, you know, 1,400 feet is, is a pretty standard internal mechanism that we use for most of these. Um, 
But beyond that, I, I ask the committee to remember, again, to see the forest and not just the trees, that there's a greater goal here to get our energy system moved over to renewables. We need this, this energy. And I'm sure there's going to be somebody come up here and blame renewables for the, for the brownouts or for there being lack of energy. But I find it very disingenuous, to say the least, to come up here and complain about renewables not putting enough energy on the grid when you're doing everything you possibly can to stop renewables from putting more energy on the grid. So again, thanks for your time. Oh, I did want to say one more thing, because my name's been mentioned. Yes, I work for a wind company. I am one of uh, a lot of folks that work in the clean energy industry. There are a lot of jobs that we're keeping out of our communities by being afraid of a, what's a very standard technology that's used all over the country. There are 70,000 wind turbines turning in the United States, 3,500 of them in the state of Illinois. They aren't, they aren't dangerous, folks. Thank you. I now call Stephen Smith. My name is Stephen R. Smith. I live at 454 County Road, 2400 East, Broadlands, Illinois, 61816. And I would like to address the Champaign County Board of Environmental Land Use, as well as the ZBA. Board members, the Champaign County Zoning Board of Appeals has amended the zoning ordinance. They have done their own research, as well as looking over research presented by the public who have attended their meetings. Most of this research was done by experts in their ex respective fields, covering such issues as setbacks from property lines, damage to drainage of val valuable farmland, shadow flicker, which can cause epileptic seizures, sound pollution, which in addition to being annoying, can cause health and sleep issues, maximum tower heights of under 500 feet, the disruption of agricultural practices, namely aerial spraying, flashing aircraft lights, the loss of some of the nation's most fertile and productive farmland, soil compaction from large cranes and equipment, killing birds that eat large amounts of insects, as well as the degraded homeowner's value due to the ugly towers ruining the pristine scenery. The zoning board worked hard and came up with good, if not perfect, solutions to help mitigate some of these problems. The residents of the area came out in force to these meetings, as proven by the number of signatures on the sign-in sheets for each meeting of the ZBA. I personally attended the last meeting of the ELUC, at that meeting, there was only one person from the wind farm company that was against the zoning board ordinances. Apart from that man, there were approximately three members of your committee who want to override or coerce the zoning board to change the ordinances. When I attended school, I was taught the government was of the people, for the people, and by the people. It is to protect the rights of all, which is guaranteed by the majority, and their ability to discern in a given case the wisest course of action, which clearly backed the zoning board ordinances. These zoning board ordinances were meticulously researched, well thought out, and protect the good people of this county. The people themselves agree with the zoning ordinances, and now we the people are here to appeal to the research of the zoning board and our sacred democratic process to uphold the decision of the zoning board. These windmills are not temporary. They are long-term scars on the land, which will be here at least 50 years. I can confidently say most, if not all of us in attendance tonight, are pleading with you to uphold the previous ruling. 
for the sake of the health of the good people of this county and for our way of life, for our land, and for our children. Thank you for your time, and may God bless you in this county. Respectfully submitted by Stephen R. Smith. Thank you, Stephen. Anybody want a copy of this? I can. Pass, I have several to pass around. Mary, if you could. They. Uh, and if you don't have enough, they'll make sure that we get these. Uh, Susan took one, and she'll distribute. All right, thank you, sir. I now call Kelly Vetter. Okay, my name is uh, Kelly Vetter, and I represent the family farm at 525 County Road 2400 East in Broadland. We, as a county, determine our own ordinances to protect our people from being taken advantage of and to provide and care for our people and our land within the county. We are thankful that our zoning board and county board are reviewing and listening to our citizens who vote them in and expect them to be, protect our people, homes, and land. The zoning board has used most of the recommendations that we would like to do to protect the people and the animals of the land. It is not that we have to fit into what the turbine corporations require, but that we had to follow our that they had to follow our guidelines or move on. Money offered by the turbine company to shirk the responsibility of the county board would be counterproductive to their duty. Their first duty is to protect its citizens and not make money deals to prosper the community at large. To be realistic, in the long term, signing a contract for 50 years or even 30 would be irresponsible considering how much the wind industry will change in that time. We will be left holding the bag of an antiquated system unhealthy for man or bird. This current system uses an incredible amount of fossil fuels to create and erect giant turbines and then ultimately dumps the huge 150 to 350 foot blades into local landfills. And these are huge amount of fossil fuels to decommission them as well. Not to mention the soil disruption that occurs upon setting up and maintaining them. I am not against wind energy, just against it in its current form, with all its unrenewable and unclean energy. Shall I mention the fact that we subsidize 80% of that energy? So why would I want to spend my forced taxation for green energy on something that will hurt my neighbors, my land, or the ecology of our environment? If you think that creating a not-so-strict ordinance is going to benefit the community through money, your troubles and worries are just beginning. You as a zoning board would be called to regulate the wind companies to keep their word on so many issues, drainage dishes, water wells, ponding, noise, and infrasound, shadow flickering, light pollution, blade throw, wildlife, etc. I will add to this. Think about the industrial wind company that paid $8 million fined for killing 150 bald eagles. Just the cost of doing business, I guess. Bald eagles have been cited here. We, are we willing to accept this unintended consequence? What about the wetlands that harbor migratory birds? Are we willing to watch them being slaughtered as well? You, the zoning board, and the county board will be called upon to regulate these things, and you will get daily calls. Trust me, lots of other counties who have allowed wind companies to come in are facing these obstacles. Maybe because these counties trust the turbine companies to follow through on their word and their contracts, but as soon as possible, they sell off to another turbine company, making it very difficult to get solutions. Already, other counties and lots of states are finding landowners who are filing suit against wind companies with a nuisance lawsuit. Nuisance laws protect owners from interference with the use and enjoyment of their property by acts occurring somewhere other than on their own property. In other words, landowners can file a nuisance lawsuit against the wind energy company, even if that company never set foot on their property. 
Some landowners who are filing lawsuits seek injunctions to shut down the project and demand millions of dollars in damages, claiming the wind farm is a nuisance. But why should people have to go that far? Because they reside in a county that did not protect their basic right? Which will you choose? Why don't we instead embrace a legacy view of our land for our future? Why don't we watch for new alternatives with better outcomes and write strict ordinances that protect us now? Thank you. Thank you. I now call Philip Lubenhaus. I hope I said that right. If not, please correct me. I want to say L U E B L I E. You will tell me how to pronounce that when you sit down. Of course. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Philip Lutkehans. Uh, I represent property owners in the area. I'll try and keep this as quick as possible. I may be quick, so I apologize. We also have a number of exhibits that I will have handed out afterwards if it's okay, but all it'll do is slow me down right now. Um, Brookfield sent a letter, and they talked about what Cal California Ridge is right now. That's not the question. If I tell you to build a four-inch cake, you build a four-inch cake. If I tell you I want a 12-inch cake, you build a 12-inch cake. What they did now was meet the current ordinance. I understand that. But that's not what says they can't do in the future. The wind company executives have admitted under oath that if you make them go to 3,000 or 3,250, they can do it. They just got to get more land. They can do it. They may not want to. They may go down the street for a while, but they can do it. Mr. Hankard is, I think, Brookfield had also submitted evidence from, or a letter from, says noise should be measured at the residence. Hogwash. The state of Illinois law is very clear, and I'll have a memo I'll give to you, which is Exhibit A, that it is measured at the residential land. So if I have a five-acre parcel that I don't farm, it's measured at the edge of my land. If I have a 10-acre or a 50-acre parcel that I farm, it's measured at the area where I use as my residence, where my kids play, where we live. The farm, I agree, but residential property is where this starts. Mr. Hankard keeps saying this. He's been saying this for five, six years. Only under cross-examination does he admit that's the case. That's what you're getting from the wind companies here. You're getting half-truths, and you'll hear more of it in a second. Um, in your packet is a PowerPoint from Dr. Punch. Michigan State University audiologist. Uh, I will also hand to you comments he has regarding Mr. Hankard's report. Dr. Punch has been doing this for many years, and uh, you'll see the notes and his comments to things from Mr. Hankard. You also see in Exhibit C, which is a Health Canada, which I'll give you, which is his analysis of the Health Canada study that Mr. Hankard relies upon. Um, sorry, can I stop for one second? I apologize. Honestly, when I came in late, I didn't expect to be going on for it. Um, so you also have um, Yeah, Mr. Mary. Uh, yeah, keep track that it's a uh, two, two and, and a half, half minutes. Whatever, yeah. OK. Mr. Hankard testifies about, talks about the WHO limits, what WHO says. No. WHO set the limit at the equivalent of 38.5 dBA. That's what Dr. Punch says. That's what Mr. James says, who is an acoustician, has been doing this for many, many years. Um, talks about studies that use infrasound. Those are synthesized insta ins infrasound. Infrasound, in this case, pulsates. That's what people are hearing is this pulsation, the difference in sound. It's, that's what's caused the problem. Um, you have in your packet, I believe, Testimony from Dr. Schomer, reports from Dr. Schomer, who is one of the most world-renowned experts in this field. Dr. Hessler, Dr. Or George Hessler, Dr. Schomer, they're all in this 38 to 40 dBA. You're going to hear from the wind companies, oh, no, 45, 50 is fine. You notice they're all paid experts by the wind companies. Mr. Hankard's been doing this for a ton of years for the wind companies. No one else. 
just the wind companies. Dr. Schomer, who Mr. Hankard has worked with, worked for both. Um, and you'll see that in the studies. You saw it already in the stuff I, we provided at the first hearing. I think it's also important to know, you must rely on what was before the ZBA. Wind companies presented nothing before the ZBA, not one piece of evidence. If you're going to change your zoning ordinance, you have to rely on evidence in the public hearing. That's what your ZBA relied upon, the evidence in the public hearing. Um, Hankard cherry picks different parts of different reports. I'll provide you those reports, some of them, the ones I was able to find in 48 hours and highlight the areas that he picks certain parts. And I'll point out and that the highlights will show other parts that don't support his position. I think it's important if you're going to do this, do it right. Do a full hearing. Have time to bring in experts. Bring them in. Give them lead time, not 15 days, not 25 days, so you can really hear from the people who do this for a living. Um, your ordinance needs work. And I know this is not about that, and I've got 10 more seconds, but you have decommissioning problems. You don't have an escrow for people who file. You, the insurance is not right. It needs work. You need a full overhaul to protect you, not just the 3250. The 3250 is necessary. The 38 DBA is necessary. But you okay. need an overhaul to protect the county. Yeah, your time Thank is you. up. Thank you for coming. I now call Justin Bowers. Hello. Good evening, everyone. My name is uh, Justin Bowers with Hanker Environmental. We're an acoustic consulting firm from Wisconsin, and we're here because Brookfield Renewables asked us to review the proposed changes and comment on the ordinance, uh, which we have provided in the form of letter. I hope you guys all have that. Um, I'm just here to discuss the contents of that letter and sum it up. Uh, the first item that's proposed to be changed is a setback distance, uh, 3250 feet from any property line. I'm not going to comment on the specific distance here, because I'm assuming it's related to noise, but in Illinois, uh, assessing noise limit at the property line isn't really appropriate. It's because there are different noise limits depending on the land use. Uh, you have residential, agricultural, industrial land. The most stringent limits are for residential land use, and on top of that, you have even more stringent limits during nighttime hours. And all of this is done to provide a greater degree of protection from sleep disturbance. And developers of the wind projects know this. So when they design projects, they design them to meet the residential nighttime noise limits at every residence. Uh, the next item is a 39 dBA overall noise limit. And this is a bit different than the current limits in Illinois, because Illinois does it a little bit different than most jurisdictions. Typically, you see noise levels regulated on an overall A-weighted basis, but in Illinois, it's done in nine different octave bands, so you have different limits for different frequencies. I'm not going to get into the math on how you get from octave bands to A-weighted levels. If anyone's interested, I'd be more than happy to discuss that later with them, but I'll just talk about some of the, some of the overall A-weighted levels that we've measured in Illinois in the past 10 years. Um, we've measured 15 locations four different wind farms, multiple turbine models. And what we find is when the wind turbine noise levels are within the IPCB limits, you get overall A-weighted levels anywhere from 43 to 47 dBA. Typically, it's about 45 dBA, but we do measure as high as 47 dBA, and that's um, that typically occurs at only a few residences for a very small percentage of the time. Um, so if we just compare those levels to 39, it may not seem like a large change if we use the analogy of perhaps a speed limit, but let's say you're going from 45 to 39 miles per hour. That doesn't seem like a large change, but we're dealing with logarithmic math. 
for wind turbine noise levels. Decibels are on a logarithmic scale. So going from 45 to 39 would be more like going from a speed limit of 45 to 22 or 23. It's about half. And that's a pretty large change. I can talk about where the 39 dB limit comes from. Um, there's been various studies into the health effects from wind turbine noise over the last few years. The two most rigorous studies are Health Canada's 2016 findings and the World Health Organization in 2018. Uh, health Canada studied over 1,000 residences living near wind farms and noise levels were up to 46 decibels. And their conclusion is ultimately there's no adverse health effects from wind turbines. The World Health Organization also looked into the issue and their ultimate conclusion was there's no evidence of adverse health effects from wind turbines. They did recommend a conditional recommendation of 45 dBA. So you might be wondering if Health Canada had 46 and the World Health Organization has 45, where do you get 39? Uh, 39 is from the World Health Organization recommends 45 L-DEN, which is a day, evening, night average level. So if you assume that the wind turbines operate 24-7, 365 at max acoustic emissions, then yeah, 39 dBA would be appropriate, but the reality is they don't. Uh, they don't operate all the time, and when they do operate, the majority of the time, they're not operating at max acoustic emissions. Uh, the last item on the list was an 80 decibel limit for infrasound, and infrasound from wind turbines has been studied by numerous institutions all around the world. Governments in Japan, Australia, Germany, Canada, uh, they all come to the same conclusion and that's, yeah, turbines do produce infrasound but they're at levels much below the human perceptibility. So it is measurable with scientific equipment but not only does infrasound not cause any adverse health effects, it's not detectable by human perception. All right, Thank you. Time, sir. Thank you. I now call Kyle Berry. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Kyle Berry. I'm an attorney based in Springfield. And I've been doing zoning and permitting hearings in the renewable energy industry now for about a dozen years. Um, I've uh, done w wind permitting hearings and specifically in Bureau, Ford, LaSalle, Lee, Marshall, Mason, McDonough, Morgan, Peoria, and Logan counties. Uh, over the last couple of years, I tallied it up the other day, I think uh, I've uh, helped permit about 2,500 megawatts of wind and solar projects that have either been uh, constructed or uh, are to be constructed. Um, some of the wind projects I've worked on recently uh, in uh, Bureau, Lee, and LaSalle counties are actually repowers. The, Companies are removing the existing turbines and putting up more efficient ones. And so I just want to give you some perspective and some history and discuss a few facts tonight. Um, in all of those other counties, um, I, again, I did, I did hearings, and, and I've been opposed, or I, those pro some of the projects were opposed by Mr. Lutka Hens, and um, actually Ted Hartke was uh, testified against uh, at, at one of them. So and in each instance, uh, the projects ended up getting a permit. So I just want to Again, trying to put that in perspective around uh, what other counties around the state are doing. Um, I met uh, Dr. Paul Schomer about 11 years ago, and I met him because he was my expert witness for the Sugar Creek Wind Project in Logan County. At the time, that project uh, was proposed to have 117 wind turbines, and the setbacks were only 1,000 feet. Uh, Dr. Schomer testified that the project uh, met the applicable noise standards, including the Pollution Control Board uh, standards. He had, in spite of the fact that the, uh, some of the turbines were only about 1,000 feet away. That project eventually was built uh, over the last couple years, and it had about half as many turbines, but uh, Dr. Schomer had no problem um, with the sound effects of having 117 turbines in Logan County back in 2011. I also want to point out, as you probably are aware, that Dr. Schomer is not a medical doctor. He was uh, the expert witness that I presented on sound issues, not on medical issues. I have, however, presented 
uh, on at least one occasion in Morgan County, a medical doctor who's a, um, a sleep expert as well as a, uh, uh, a neuro uh, some sort of neurologist, and uh, he testified that the, the wind project in Morgan County uh, would have no um, negative health effects. Um, I actually agree with uh, Mr. Lutkehans on a couple things. Number, number one, uh, he indicated that the Pollution Control Board rules, the noise rules, uh, are, uh, are, are based on the use of the property. So you measure from the agricultural use where the turbine is located and to residential use. And the residential use um, is not always clearly defined. It's, it's fact specific. It's based on the particular uh, residence or home. And, uh, and I do agree that you should measure from where the, uh, the homeowner uses the property as residence. But on many occasions, you can tell by looking at Google Earth that there's a pretty defined yard versus the cornfield that sur surrounds it. So uh, where I probably wouldn't agree is where you draw the lines for the residential use. Uh, finally, the other uh, thing that I would uh, potentially agree with Mr. Lutkehans on is that um, I don't, I'm not quite certain, and I guess I'll just raise this as a potential legal issue to close with, but you know, what, uh, what increasing the, the, the noise standards in particular and applying them specifically to the, the type of use, the, exclusively to wind turbines as a use, I think that raises potential equal protection concerns, potentially. So I, I would encourage you to talk to your state's attorney's office about that. And I'm not sure because, uh, again, I haven't read, I haven't looked at every piece of evidence that was submitted at this EBA hearing, but I'm not sure there was a significant amount of uh, medical evidence that demonstrated that uh, the turbines, the, the, the noise generated uh, from the turbines would cause uh, health issues. So, I mean, I would tend to agree that, that you should take care in, in considering maybe taking on some additional some, uh, evidence at, at subsequent hearings because I'm not sure what's uh, been put forward so far is sufficient to satisfy the, uh, some of the legal standards, including things like rational basis, um, and could subject the, the ordinances, if adopted, to an arbitrary and capricious uh, argument. So in the end, I, I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight and for holding this hearing. All right, thank you. I now call Ben Mallorin. 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 And you can fix me when you get up there. Mallardy. Thank you. So firstly, I'd like to thank the ZBA and the ELA committees for allowing me to speak tonight. Um, <clears throat> I work for Brookfield Renewable. I'm a technical specialist in wind energy. Uh, Brookfield is uh, a renewable energy company with about 21,000 megawatts uh, in operation today. 21 wind farms uh, in the U.S. Uh, alone. One of those wind farms is California Ridge. California Ridge is the only operating wind farm within Champaign County. Um, I, my, I myself have worked in the wind energy industry for a number of years. Six of those years, I worked in Findlay, Ohio. Um, in Findlay, Ohio, my office was located within 650 foot from the nearest wind turbine, and I was within 1,000 feet from three additional wind turbines. So I think suffice to say, I've worked in and around wind turbines um, quite a lot and have a lot of experience doing so. Um, we're, I'm here today to discuss uh, the three issues being uh, proposed. Um, I will leave the, the sound arguments to the experts um, that we've already had testify here today, as well as the uh, testimony that we've submitted uh, via Mike Hankard. Um, what I will say on that is I think it's been made very clear that uh, what's being argued tonight is not with respect to noise, it's not with concern to noise, it's with respect to eliminating wind farms within Champaign County. Um, the sole purpose of these uh, proposals is to um, halt wind development within the county, and I think we need to maintain focus on that. Um, with that being said, I'd also like to mention that uh, to date, California Ridge has received zero noise complaints within Champaign County. 
um, as a course of normal operation. Um, moving to the setback ordinance, sorry, moving to the 3,250 foot setback that's being proposed. Um, this recommendation, as long as well as the noise recommendations, are not based on sound or consensus science, which is shown again in the, the memo provided. The recommendations, the recommendation of 3,250 foot is a drastic increase from what is currently in place today and would effectively eliminate the ability to site a wind turbine within Champaign County. Um, in front of you is an exhibit. It's mostly a red sheet of paper. It's an analysis that I actually had performed that uh, shows that anywhere within the project area, there is no area that would comply with the proposed 3,250 foot setback uh, being put forth to you today. Now, you could waive that requirement and thus put a wind turbine uh, if, if the landowner within 3,250 foot was uh, willing to waive that. However, uh, a study shows that uh, at California Ridge, there's 134 turbines. Each of those turbines would have 33, or on average 32 rather, landowners that would need to therefore waive. So what that means is a little over half a mile away from your piece of property, someone can unilaterally tell you what you can and cannot do as it relates to wind, uh, wind turbines on your property. Now, I think that is a, a big detriment to Champaign County. California Ridge has offered a number of benefits to, to the counties which it operates in. That's including 1.8 million in property taxes, 400,000 of which uh, goes to Champaign County. That includes 13 full-time locally employed staff, uh, periodic use of local contractors in and around the wind farm. Um, in addition to that, since 2012, the energy generated is the equivalent of taking 850,000 cars off the road today. Um, I've been made aware that uh, there is uh, another text amendment that had been proposed which uh, focuses on a two times tip height and 2.4 times tip height. Uh, and I'll make this quick here. Uh, essentially, um, the industry standard setback is 1,000 feet from dwellings. Those two setbacks are essentially in line. What that they do offer, though, in addition, is they scale with wind turbines. So as wind turbines increase, as uh, the technology gets more efficient, those setbacks will scale with them. And for that reason, I recommend Champagne proceed with the recommended setbacks set forth in cases 037-18-22. Okay, Thank you. I now call Kathy Shannon. My name is Kathy Shannon. I live in the city of Champaign. I already sent, uh, I think, everyone here an email um, urging you to actually do whatever you can to encourage wind power instead of changing ordinances to make it virtually impossible in the county. I just want to add a couple of things based on things that have happened this week and um, based on earlier comments that I've heard. First of all, um, there were two school referendums in the area that failed this week, and they failed dramatically. We need to fund our schools, and the idea that we would kick out developers of wind energy when we are in such desperate need of funding for our children's education is, is, is horribly disappointing to me. Um, you know, in Champaign, we have the property taxes to be able to fund our schools, but our rural school districts are desperately hurting, um, and, and we need these developments. Um, another thing is the, um, this week, the, in fact, today, the Supreme Court severely limited the ability of the EPA to um, regulate power plant emissions. And so this is going to be something that's going to fall on us locally. And we need to ensure that we have clean energy here, because clean energy is the future. That is what we need for our children. Um, so, which brings me to point out that every single negative thing discussed here about wind power 
is worse with fossil fuels. If we were to start over again and look at what energy should we allow and what energy should we not allow, the answer would be overwhelmingly obvious. Um, fossil fuels, particularly when pipelines leak, they degrade our soils, they degrade our drinking water. Fossil fuels destroy habitat. They kill far more birds than wind turbines would ever do. And they are overwhelmingly subsidized by our taxes. The amount of subsidies that wind and solar, for that matter, get is a drop in the bucket compared to the subsidies that we give for fossil fuels. If we applied those same standards to things like highways, fossil fuels, oil wells, coal, coal plants, et cetera, we would have no energy, we would have no transportation, and we would have no infrastructure. I realize that you know nothing is perfect, no solution is perfect, but this is a far, far better solution than what we currently have, and, and we need to do everything that we can to encourage it, and this is for our future and for our children's future. Thanks. Thank you. I now call Matthew Frank. Mike, please. Yeah, turn that uh, microphone back on. Oh, OK. Sorry. Very good. That's all set. Um, hi, my name is Matt Frank. I'm, uh, from, I, I live at 2207 O'Donnell Drive in Champaign, the uh, city of Champaign. Um, I'm here to oppose uh, amending the Champaign County Zoning Ordinance uh, to further restrict wind power construction. Um, specifically, I'd like to address, uh, I don't know any, anything about infrasound or um, setback limits, but I, I'm particularly uh, like to address the 39 uh, DBA. Yeah, if you could lean into that. I, I apologize. Um, I'd like to address the, the, the uh, proposed r r restriction to 39 DBA. Um, first, I'd like to say I, I don't think the county uh, should be using their regulatory power to um, restrict productive business uses of Class C land. Um, I do think the county has an interest in regulating pollution from Class C properties impinging on Class A properties. I think the county should focus on um, quantifying and regulating the pollution limits they think are appropriate across the board, across all, all uses, um, rather than imposing specific setback and noise limits only on specific technologies or use cases. Um, so at the top of page four of the agenda packet, uh, it, it suggests that the current Illinois Pollution Control Board noise regulations are not sufficient because wind turbines did not even exist when the regulations were created. Yet, IPCB uh, Title 35 um, was revisited and amended in 2004, 2006, 2007, 2015, and 2018. Um, so the Illinois Pollution Control Board has looked at, is aware of, it, uh, of, of wind turbines. Um, I, I encourage you to carefully study and understand the nighttime limits on noise pollution in Title 35. Um, that restrict the nighttime uh, emissions of, of noise from Class C land received by Class A land. Um, if you believe they're not strict enough, uh, I encourage you to change them for all land uses, not just for uh, wind towers. Um, but please be aware uh, that those limits um, for Class C land impinging on Class A land currently are uniformly, as a previous speaker said, um, Illinois does it a bit differently than using DBA. Um, but the limits in Illinois are uniformly stricter than 46 DBA for Class C land in pitching on, on uh, Class A land. Um, and if you were to impose a limit of 39 DBA on Class C property owners, you would be required. And, and in fact, um, 46 DBA uh, is, is stricter across all frequency ranges. and it's stricter than 39 dBA below 50 hertz and above 2,000 hertz um, already. Uh, so if you were to impose a, a limit of 39 dBA in Class C property owners, you would be requiring um, Class C properties to be as quiet as Class A properties in the 125 hertz to 250 hertz frequency range. Um, so basically, you're saying that people on wind farms or, or any uses of, of Class C properties should be as quiet as, as a residence at night. Um, 
that, that's pretty restrictive. But if you think that that's uh, appropriate for all land uses of Class C land, then go ahead and, and pass that regulation. But please don't restrict it to uh, to, to, to a single use, a, a productive business use um, that, that some landowners would, would, would prefer to use uh, than other land uses. Thank you. Thank you. Constance Music. And again, you can correct me when you arrive. Mike, please. Sorry for the time. Um, I'm Constance Music. Um, I'm a resident. And again, if you could get close to the mic, you can pull the whole thing closer to you if you don't want to lean forward. I'm a resident of uh, Champaign County. I'm also a member of Local Labor 703. I have worked with Wind Farms, or as I should say, Windmills. Um, Champaign County needs to bring us some better paying jobs into the area to keep some of us going in our area, not having us look outside to spend our money to put forth. We want to keep it in our community. So I'm going to keep it short. Okay, no, I'm, I, I would like you to just get louder. I, I don't hear well. So. Oh, you don't? <laughs> yeah, I, we have some members of the board like me who want to hear what you have to say. Okay, I'm just looking to have jobs brought back into our community to generate some money for all of us. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Victor Munoz. Hello, my name is Victor Munoz. I live in Champaign County, Champaign. I'm here to represent the Labor's Local 703, as well as Constance. Um, we basically, it's, it, it's all the work that they're doing in the, as far as the windmill farms is all trade work, it's all union work, and it all just generates within our community with our all members. Whatever they do use as far as you know, uh, carpenters, uh, laborers, operators, it's all union work. So that just all that makes all money coming into our community. And that's one of the biggest things for us as far as for our trades, because like what Constance was saying, a lot of guys, are they travel or they go out of state or out of, and that's not what we want. We want to basically stay in our area and generate the money for our area and just continue staying here. And I think it's, a, I think it's important to bring this work here for us, for our community, and yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. It. I'm not going to say anything about handwriting because mine is atrocious. But I will now call Roger Henning, see if I got that right. And you can correct me when you get up there. My name is Roger Henning. I live at 1664 East County Road 600 North, Milo, Illinois. Uh, I had some notes prepared, but one thing I'm hearing tonight, there's a lot of people that want this wind farm, don't live around here, but don't live by it. So I don't see how they're going to be really affected by it. So I'll get back to what I came here to say the first time. I want to thank the ZBA for listening to us over the several weeks with the stuff we presented you. <clears throat> I think you came up with a sensible and healthy guidelines for wind farm requirements. I was at the last DLUC meeting, and I believe the chair stated that Champaign County, he thought, had the strictest wind farm rules 10 years ago. with wind farm regulations in the state of Illinois. Well, lots changed in 10 years. A lot of studies have been proven and shown you and presented to ZBA over the last several weeks say the setback should be farther. We have a neighbor 
County Edgar with a 32.50 setback. <clears throat> I want to stress that the setback should be from property lines. I have property that I, I live on 30 acres. I got a five and a half acres for my house. I got 11 acres in a tree program. The rest is tillable. I'm in those trees two or three times a week. That's on the other corner of my, from my house. I really don't want to be hearing wind farms bother me. That's part of my property, not just where I live. My property is where I live. <clears throat> So I believe, I believe we need to accept the guidelines set by ZBA, let landowners and homeowners affected by the wind farm negotiate themselves. If they need to bring it to ZBA for a variance, then let them do so. No different than anyone building too close to a property line or set back in town set by zoning committee. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Right. In, in the hour, we're going to do one more, and then I think we're going to entertain a motion to continue because we're actually doing quite well with our slips, and I want everyone to get a chance. So the last official person in the hour, Don Carter. And your penmanship is not too bad, Don. My name is Don Carter, and I live at 1799 County Road 800 North Philo. Thank you for your time. Uh, my wife and I retired to this rural haven uh, many years ago, and it, it, it's a wonderful property. Uh, we live there. We live in the footprint of a proposed wind farm. Not official yet or anything, but they're, they're out there getting their contracts signed and things like that. So I, we are affected by it. We're going to be affected by it. And we have put in a lot of time with the zoning board uh, trying to present our case because as I've said before we can't do anything about it we have to come to our representatives to run interference for us and to make sure that as your constituencies our interests are protected so I am here to in total support of what the zoning board has recommended in the areas of uh, both noise and setback I think it's particularly instructive that, uh, that one of the young men who was the expert or worked for the wind company, uh, he even has the ability to understand what our intent is. Not just about what the effect would be, but he knows what our intent is. So I think that's an unusual ability. The truth of it is I think it shows the recklessness that people like this are willing to go to to achieve their ends in any particular area. He doesn't know what our intent is. Our intent is for people like me and my wife, if we do have wind energy come in, that it's something that we can live with. I think it's also important, even Dr. Schomer's testimony. I think it's a very different situation if you ask Dr. Schomer to come into a a room and testify about what is possible versus what is uh, going to result in the least amount of complaints by the souls that live there. I think you get a different outcome from him on that. The other thing we keep talking about, health effects. There's an awful lot to do with just, quality, just plain quality of life. Not necessarily that you're physically sick, but we've heard testimony from people that work under these things, and they would say, I would hate to live there. I've invested a lot of money in my property. I want that property, as I pass that on to my children, to still be worth at least what I have put into it. And I don't think that's going to be the case if we live in the footprint of, a, of an over-industrialized wind farm. Again, I'm not against wind energy. I don't think the technology is what it needs to be yet. I think they're over-industrialized. I don't think they're the best land use. Uh, we've seen the results down in Douglas County. People have 
stood up here and asked you, just drive down there. If you, don't, if you want to understand what's going on, just drive down there and see what the result has been. So, I, again, I'm begging you, please adopt the recommendations of your zoning board. They put in a lot of time. They've heard a lot of testimony. They've uh, digested a lot of data. And they've come up with what I believe is a, a good recommendation. With, in their mind, the people who are going to have to live with the thing. I think you need to keep that in mind. Because people in Champaign aren't going to have to live with that. Let's put a couple up in West Side Park. Thank you very much. Right at this point, I would entertain a motion to extend public input beyond the hour. So moved. Mary? Oh, I'll second. second. Second by Stephanie. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? All right. We will uh, continue so that we can get everyone in. I call Charles Mitzdarfer. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, Charles Mitzdorfer, 1587 County Road, 300 North, Tolono. Uh, let's see. I would like to mention that I agree with everything Mr. Carter just said. I think he says most of what I'm thinking very well, so this may not take as long. Um, I do apologize for my handwriting. I did not know that was a requirement, but I'm going to try to go through my handwritten notes, so I apologize in advance. Um, I do appreciate your time this evening. I have not been paid by any organization to be here tonight. I'll make that ex expressly clear. Um, most of us behind me are here because we are passionate about our professions, about our lifestyles, about our families, about where we want to live. Let's be honest, this is Illinois, and there's a lot of things we have going for us here in this county, but a lot of things not going for us in this state. So the fact that we all want to be here in this very county, I think, says a lot. And we want to be here and raise our kids and our families here. Um, I do want to express my full support for the recommendations presented to you guys by the ZBA. Um, they spent a lot of time on that, a lot of effort, as everybody else has mentioned here. And um, I just want to fully express my support for those recommendations. I am completely against the wind turbines in this area um, as present. Again, I don't think the technology is there either to be all that um, all that efficient and safe to be living amongst all of us. I just don't think it's there yet. Uh, man, um, our prime farmland, okay? We're surrounded by it. Um, There's a guy that was here talking about Effingham and some of the use there. Well, that's not exactly as good a farm ground as here, but it's still farm ground, right? So we're fortunate, okay? We have some of the best farm ground, not just in this state or country, but in the world. And it's a darn dirty shame to try to take it out of production, unless it's a very good reason, and I have not seen one yet. Um, I'm sure everybody knows that, but I just wanted to repeat it. That is some of the best ground God's given us, all right, on this green earth. Speaking of green, green earth, you guys been out driving around the countryside lately? Anybody? You talk about green, you'd be hard pressed to find an area that's not green right now. It's because of the corn and soybeans growing right now, okay? It brings a huge amount of money. Uh, just like Dr. Cameron mentioned, huge amount of money, jobs, tax revenue to our county. That's worth, rem worth remembering and worth keeping in mind. Um, all of us enjoy our way of life out in the rural part of the county. And for those of you who may enjoy a wonderful way of life in town or in the city, that's great. Uh, we should all be able to do that. Um, but we really treasure our, our ground out in the rural part of the county. Um, there are homes, our farms, our livelihood, and we're just trying to protect them. Okay. Um, why do you think we're all here tonight? Okay. Um, most of us actually took off work today because um, our work day doesn't end at 5 o'clock or 4.30. We took off work. It's still daylight, right? There's a lot that could be done today, and it's been nice out. But this is important to us. We're here. Okay. So please just understand the sacrifices we make, too, just to be here to plead our case. All right. 
So I'll kind of rush through this. I'm kind of long-winded here. Um, California Ridge was mentioned. Um, I do want to mention that in that instance, right now what's being proposed in spite of some of the uh, um, developments that are trying to take place in this county now, a lot of those are leases. California Ridge actually sold parcels of ground. Um, well, sorry, owners sold to California Ridge. Um, that land then proceeded to change hands several times uh, over the course of like 10 years, uh, out of state, in state, back and forth. And then there are actually property taxes that were not paid on time. That's from a company. If any of us here at this table right now did that, we'd be in big trouble. But they were able to do it, okay? So keep that in mind. What, what does that tell you about the way they operate? What kind of reserves do they have to protect everything they're saying? Okay. Uh, everybody says, think of the tax revenue. Dr. Camber mentioned that. Look at the economy that farming brings to this county and the tax revenue. Um, this affects our food and our water supply. Wars have been started over both of those things. Look around the world today. I think it's worth keeping our food and our ability to produce food safely and our groundwater supply safe as we can. I'm gonna run out of time. Um, anyway, I just wanna stress again, please don't waste the ZBA's time. They spend a lot of time and effort on these recommendations and I fully support them and I think you guys should too. Thank you. Thank you. I now call Justin Learcamp. Justin Learcamp, I live in rural Sydney. I also uh, farm in Douglas County underneath the footprint of the new 585 foot tall turbines in Douglas County. So I have some personal experience with those. Um, Eric, or Mr. Thorsland mentioned last time of the state bill that had been proposed a few times um, about taking zoning control away from the counties and moving to state level. I've been aware of that since they introduced that a few sessions ago. And I think uh, whatever side of the issue you are on tonight, um, that's not anything that, that we want. I'd rather see it controlled here locally. Uh, I have my voice here where I wouldn't in Springfield. So I appreciate your time listening to me and CPA's time over the last several months. So I'd like to say that I am not against renewable energy uh, by any means. Uh, I have a solar panel in my yard. Um, renewables are important. I think they may be the future. Um, industrial wind complexes are something completely different than renewable energy supplied at a homeowner level. Um, Stan mentioned putting some turbines on the quad or Hessel Park, it's been mentioned uh, in you know, West Champaign. Um, the county's got a lot of land here at the Broken Center. Well, you know, why, are, why isn't the county taking the lead and putting a wind turbine up? So, um, I, like I said, I'm not against renewable energy. I'm just looking for realistic, setbacks to protect my property that I have huge investments in. Um, this is an industrial thing that is moving to a rural area, a residential area, and it's not contained to a 40 acre parcel on the corner. This is something you're going to see and feel and hear for miles. So when we look at our current zoning of 1200 foot we know that's not enough. We're looking for something that is more reasonable, give us more protection. Um, I don't know a lot about decibels and sound and what 80 sounds like or 40 or, you know, I, I don't know what those numbers mean. But I can tell you from working underneath the Douglas County wind turbines, they are loud. They're not loud every day, but it depends on the environment and the wind direction how windy it is, how fast they're turning, density, a lot of factors that I don't understand. They are loud at 1,200 feet. They are loud at 1,500 feet. They are loud at 1,800 feet. They are loud at 2,500 feet. And you get to 2,500 feet, you've got multiple ones coming around you. And so you don't know which direction it's coming from. 
but I hear them every day when I'm working down there, I'm mowing, I'm in the yard doing things in that area. And that property is in Champaign County. And there's a turbine right across the road. Um, I need to measure it. I would say it's probably about 1,200 feet from the road or less. If you look at it, it looks like if it fell over, it would land in Champaign County. I know that's not the case, but the perception of how tall these are. So what we're looking for, much what ZBA recommended, protection. The people that spoke tonight pretty well fall in two camps, as Mr. Carter mentioned. Uh, people that either work for a wind energy company, been paid by a wind energy company, or they live in Champaign, or Urbana, or more urban area. And the other segment of people who live in the rural areas. Everybody's voice is important, and I appreciate everybody getting to be heard. We are the ones that are gonna have to deal with it. My kids are the ones that are gonna have to deal with it. And I could be labeled as an NIMBY, you know, not in my backyard, but the fact of the matter is, I control the land a mile south of my house, a mile east of my house, good relationships with the neighbors the other direction. There isn't gonna be a turbine within 3,000 feet of my house. I'm doing this for my kids. I'm doing it for the rest of the residents of Champaign County. And this is an important moment in Champaign County right now. So appreciate your time, thank you. Thank you. John Cutter Nickham. We're on. Hello, my name is Jane Carter Nickham, Savoy, Illinois. And I have a few different perspectives on this particular project. I've been here at the five previous meetings. And uh, my first experience, my first personal experience with wind energy was in 1992 on the southwest corner of the Big Island of Hawaii. There was a big Mitsubishi wind turbine complex there. And I was so impressed. I thought, wow, this is really cool. But there were no houses around. Nobody lived in that area. Just a couple miles to the east of that, a volcano was in the process of erupting and the lava was flowing across the highway. So, you know, there wasn't a concern about setbacks in that particular area. But now, 30 years later, I'm thinking about what about the decommissioning of those particular turbines? We heard earlier about repowering or replacing units. And I know that that's something that's been talked about, whether or not there's enough money in place in future dollars to do such things. Uh, Ted Hartke has mentioned his own personal experience outside Fithian. I remember when Ted first got his house and he was so excited about it because it was a very interesting house with indoor play facilities and all kinds of things that his kids were going to grow up and enjoy. And then all of a sudden, things changed. They had the wind and the, or the noise and the vibrations and everything from the wind turbines that were very close to his house. He ultimately moved out. And I think it took about three years before he finally found someone to buy that piece of property because it wasn't as marketable as it could have been, possibly due to the fact of its location near wind turbines. In Savoy, we had residents come to our board about 10 years ago, and they wanted to install wind turbines in new neighborhoods in Savoy, like Prairie, Prairie uh, Fields subdivision. And we created an ordinance that was a restrictive ordinance, but here were people that are wanting to put in various kinds of wind turbines, egg beaters, and the kinds that we see out in the fields, only much smaller, of course, because these were for their own individual homes. But we were concerned about things like fall radius and that. Nothing about the noise and the infrasound and all those things. But to my knowledge, nobody has built a wind turbine in Savoy. But we heard a comment earlier about clean energy and the fact that, you know, with the potential for brownouts and blackouts because the energy market this year was not as friendly as it could have been because of the shutting down of 
different types of power plants, but they, they made the comment earlier about, well, we need to have wind energy so that we can have all the energy to run all of our toys and our electric cars and everything that's coming down the pike. Well, some of you, I'm sure, know that there has been discussion about building a miniature or small version of a nuclear power plant near Abbott on the east side of the railroad tracks in the center of Champaign. It'll be interesting to see if some of these same folks that live in Champaign that are talking about energy and, oh, don't worry about this, don't worry about that, don't worry about setbacks, and then all of a sudden they find out that there could be a nuclear power plant built within a few blocks of their house, what their feelings might be at that time, because we know some nuclear energy operations have been extremely successful, and then there are others that have not. So lots of things to think about when we think about energy. And of course, it's just the nature of the beast of our lifestyles that we are energy dependent, but you know, at what expense? You know, is it the expense of other people's comfort levels in their own homes, comfort levels on their own property? Those are all things that I think that we need to take very seriously when we hear about what the setbacks should be. Are they great enough? Uh, the sound levels, are they too high? You know, those are all things that we need to take into consideration. And I think that the recommendations that have been put forth, the 3250, the, the uh, lower decibel numbers, the 39, the infrasound numbers, because I know we have a submariner in the group that was interested in infrasound. You know, when we look at all these different things, those are things that need to take, be taken very seriously by both organizations and by the county board as a whole to protect the interest of the people that live in those particular areas. Thank you. Thank you. I now call Ted Hartke. Good evening, I'm Ted Hartke. I live in Sydney, Illinois. I've been doing these things for a while, and I, I feel like a lightning rod. I can tell you all that um, I don't want to be here and have to tell you all this again. Um, I really wish that we'd had the chance to do some cross-examination of the folks that came up and said stuff tonight. Um, I, having lived it, I, I know where the loopholes and the, and the lies and the, and the hiding the hiding the prize. I know where those things are. I would love to cross-examine all these guys that went before me. And uh, unfortunately, our, our ZBA meetings, we can present all the testimony that we want, and then here we get limited. I tried to do presentations to the ELEC committee, but you didn't want to hear it. That's pathetic. I'm also ethically and morally not allowed to present false information to you because I'd be in violation of my professional engineering, professional land surveying, and professional design firm licenses. My livelihood depends on the truth and protecting human health, safety, welfare, all that stuff. We need to modify this uh, 80 decibels. I want to ask you to please modify the 80 decibel low frequency noise to 80 dB PK, meaning peak. That's what is, it wakes up uh, kids and wives and husbands inside their homes when you get that big thump of thump of air pressure pulse inside your house for a wind turbine uh, blade flex. It reminds you all that the minimum regulations for set, statewide setbacks in Al Gore's home state of Tennessee is 35 dBA at dwellings. 35 dBA at dwellings in all of Tennessee statewide. They, don't, they didn't come up with that standard just willy-nilly. Also, I have a timeline. May 9th of 2014. Oh, I'm going to back up a little bit. In 2011, Dr. Schomer, who measured the noise at my house while working for Invenergy, he, t he was working for a Kyle Berry Apex attorney and um, spoke in Logan County, and they got their turbine setbacks, and they met the IPCB standards. Oh, that's great. In 2013, Dr. Schomer was working for Invenergy in my backyard, and the noise levels were 0 0.1 decibels below the maximum noise level allowable in the entire state of Illinois. And then an acoustician came here tonight. I'll find his name later. He said, you know, 45 dBA, that noise level is pretty normal. 
And the reason they go down to 39 is because that's for constant noise. Well, hell, I had constant noise all night long at my house, 30, uh, 40, 46, 45 and a half, all night long, con constant average noise. That's why I'm here, just spilling my guts in front of you guys. I'm not a liar. Okay, so in 2014, after I abandoned my home in Vermilion County, Apex purchased the Roebling home for $100,000 in Vermilion County. The ultimate waiver, right? On May 27th, two weeks later, they purchased the IRIC home for $295,000. In April 29th, 2015, Apex offered good neighbor agreements to half mile setbacks, self imposed setbacks, and gave people money for half, everyone within a half mile. Apex knows they have a problem. And then in May 2015, this was just before I bought my house in Champaign County. Apex sold the $295,000 house for $117,500. All the setbacks can have waivers. We can still have wind, allow the neighbors to negotiate their own outcomes. The individual is the smallest minority. At these other meetings, we had board members say, we gotta do what's good for the whole county, the whole county. We gotta bring in the jobs and the money. What's good for the whole county is not good for the individual. That's why we have laws in place to protect minorities. The rural citizens in, Verm in Champaign, Vermilion, all these counties, we are the minorities because we don't have the money to, to fight up against these guys. I grew up 250 feet from a hog facility. My mom and dad had 2,500 pigs when I was a child for 17 years. I lived 150 feet from the CSX Railroad for three years in college. I abandoned my home 1,665 feet from the closest turbine. Dr. Schomer, who authored IPCB standards, testified in many communities IPCB regulations are inappropriate for turbines. I, I've been called a lot of stuff, and I, I can't believe that we can't let people uh, sleep in their homes. My last request is this. If the wind company is so confident everything is cool, I would like them for them to put on their application that they promise that all the children will, all, will be able to sleep in their bedrooms at night. You Have them sign that document, and that would be perfect. Your time's up. Thank you very much. Have a good night. Now, William Mitzdorfer. Mike, please. Hello. Mine is William Mitzdorfer. I live in rural Bill Grove, south part of the county. Um, it was somebody said something about property taxes for the schools, and my taxes on bare farm ground went up ten dollars this year an acre, which might not seem by a lot, but it's it's a bunch. So I think I probably pay quite a bit for the school taxes, probably more than the than the wind farm does for the average farmer. Anyway, um, I know somebody said that there's not been a single complaint in Champaign County from the California Ridge wind farm, but it's pretty sad since just because Mr. Harkey lives across the line, his doesn't count. And the last thing I had is, I'm sure everybody here has had a meal today. Probably. Well, that meal was brought to you not by wind power, just so you know. That's it. Now call Todd Herbert. Todd Herbert. 435 County Road, 1700 East, Philo. I'd like to commend the zoning board for, we did it for two months, three months, hours of testimony, and they came up with a good solution that 
our neighborhood wants, would go for. I can't help it, it's so populated out there that maybe the wind footprint of a tower won't work in Champaign County, but as long as we're healthy and uh, we're able to live with it, we're happy. And I just feel with the time they put in, it's, it's unfortunate the environmental land use doesn't like that. And, oh, I kind of forgot my train of thought here, but, uh, you know, I live in a rural neighborhood, and um, I support what they came up with. 3250 from the property line would be great. I live on a five-acre track, and I don't just sit on my porch. I go out in that five-acre track and walk my dogs, whatever. Um, so I don't want to be disturbed by that either the pulsating, the shadow flicker, and everything else. Uh, uh, we all, I know most of the people out here in the audience, and everybody moves to the country for a reason, usually. It's because of the landscape, the quietness, the sunset, the sunrise, the stars, and all that's affected. I can look not too many miles south of my house at the Douglas County Wind Farm, and Every night when I go to bed, I see the lights flickering down there. It's pretty disturbing, and I wouldn't want to live next to one of them. So that's my thoughts, and I hope the I know the zoning board has went to bat for us. I hope the ELUC committee can and the county board, and we really uh, appreciate your support. And just do the right thing for the citizens of Champaign County. Thank you. Thank you. Now call Todd Herbert. What's that? Oh, I'm sorry. Forgot to put that one on that stack. I will say, Todd, your handwriting's great. Um, Daryl Rice. Hello, I'm Daryl Rice. I live uh, out in the country outside of Philo and Farm there as well. Uh, pre appreciate all all that you folks do in service of our community here, both the board and the committee here. Thank you for hearing us out tonight. Uh, most of what I was going to say has already been said quite well, so I won't repeat it. But I just want to uh, remind you that at the first couple of ZBA meetings where this was being discussed, we had 70 or 80 people here in the crowd. And there wasn't one testimony in favor of wind farms. And most of those people lived in the footprint. Most of them are my neighbors. I know most of them by the first names. And so those are the people that are coming out to these meetings. And they are, we are passionate about this because you're talking about our homes. The people in support of this are either being paid to be in support of it, support of it or they live in town here. And it's easy to say, you know, we want this in southern Champaign County because you'll hardly even see it from Champaign. So the people that are living in the footprint of it are the people that you're seeing behind me here tonight testifying that we, we would like to see the ZBA's recommendations uh, passed by the ELUC committee. They spent hours and hours on these recommendations, and I hope you'll consider them seriously. We hope you folks are here to represent us as citizens because you can do what we can't. So we're, we're counting on you to, to give us a fair shake. Thank you. Thank you. I now call Adani Sandez. Hi, y'all. Thanks for having this study session. Um, I wish I could have been at the other ones because um, I'm not a property owner, but my understanding is that you're not allowed to tell people what to do on property that you own. I don't know if I'll ever be a property owner, but I'm really excited to move out into the country and set up my own windmill farm. Um, I really think it's important here to consider 
that fossil fuels have a definite end. We know that we're running out of them. Um, Illinois grows a lot of corn, and I think that's so valuable, and it's so important, the work that all of our farmers are doing, but it's gonna be really difficult to keep growing corn when we're seeing the variable nature of our climate right now. Like, we literally just had a week of 100 degree days, and I don't know if you can grow corn in that, um, but I don't know if someone can tell me about that later. Um, so I really hope it's important to think about renewable energy and what is Illinois doing to um, maintain independence from fossil fuels. We're seeing it at the gas pump. We're seeing the reliance on energy, on these fossil fuels um, is really detrimental. So we need to make sure that we have diversified. I hope we are encouraging several types of renewable energy and making sure that we're holding these corporations, which it seems like some of them do have some serious problems. These wind farm corporations are having some problems. So we hope, I hope that we're holding them accountable, but I don't think these amendments are addressing those things. So it, I seem to have a misconnect somehow. Um, so I hope that the amendments that are made to the ordinance are actually uh, creating more accountability for these corporations. Um, also making sure that we're encouraging more development because we need that. It's important for our community. It's important for our livelihoods. I want to continue living in a place that's not underwater. Um, I come from Texas where they don't really maintain their energy grid very well. Uh, so I really don't want to move again. <laughs> And um, I, I just want to kind of reiterate again, uh, we live in a society, I live next to power lines that are pretty ugly. I live near a whole bunch of streets with big cars that blow exhaust into my brain. Um, it's really uh, horrifying. It's part of how we live in this society. And so I think it's really important to know that this is how the, the world moves and Illinois is going to be left behind if we don't do a lot of work to get into renewable energy. And I think that this is really an opportunity for Illinois to step up and be a leader and create more jobs and build more tax bases. Um, so hopefully we can set up that infrastructure and, and you know, not be underwater and reduce our reliance on fossil fuels. So thank you so much for letting me ramble. Bye. Thank you. All right, as surprising as it seems, that's all the slips that I have of people who have filled out and wanted to speak. So I'm going to give you a chance if you want. We're at here. Matt Harriet. Oh, Matt Harriet. Okay, Matt, come on up. There he is. <laughs> Matt Harriet, I live in uh, rural Philo. And John, I appreciate you listening to me. I thought uh, you were going to put me there at the front, but good job. Um, first, I'd like to thank all of you for your service to the residents of Champaign County and using the best interest of all of the residents. Um, I appreciate all the time that the, and work that the ZBS put in this proposed text amendments, and I know a lot of people behind me has done a lot of work as well, so thank you. <clears throat> Myself, as Winnie Minnison behind me in rural Champaign County, would, would be most affected by any wind turbines in the county. I urge the ELUT committee to accept the proposed changes to the wind ordinance, especially the recommended setback from the property line of non-participating residents of 3,250 feet. I heard one person earlier talk about Class C land. And I don't know about you, but I live on six and a half acres with a home, and that is not Class C land. So 3,250 feet should be from my property line. 3,250 feet will provide adequate protection to property owners and their families for, from the adverse effects of wind turbines. The map on page 67 of the PDF handout that the Office of Planning and Zoning put together <clears throat> tonight showing space available for wind turbines is not 100% correct. There's been others that said that that eliminates wind farms, wind turbines from this county, but that is not correct. They can go out and get variances. They can get these good neighbor agreements. So to me, I've had to work for everything I've had, make them work for what they want to impose on us in the rural Champaign County. <clears throat> 3,250 feet <clears throat> does not get, or would not give the wind companies free access to the county as the original proposed proposal from ELUC. Wind companies still could apply for waivers, like I just said, <clears throat> even if the ZBA, or the proposed amendments that ZBA put forth to you. The data presented during tes public testimony of the ZBA is clear that the proposed changes by the ZBA are necessary to protect the safety and well-being of our residents. The ZBA unanimously voted for these changes to the ordinance. There is no reason for the ELOC committee to send all the changes to the full county board for a vote in passing of the amendments. 
<clears throat> One other thing that I'm not sure, I just urge all of you to actually read all the data. I've spent a lot of time reading everything before every meeting and after every meeting, so I am an informed citizen. And I urge all of you that are voting on our behalf to make sure that you've done the same. So I want you to be able to sleep 20 years from now and say, yes, I did the right thing for every single resident of this county. <clears throat> so please quit wasting everybody's time and do what is best for rural Champaign County and pass the ZBA's proposed amendments soon. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, does anyone else want to speak tonight who hasn't spoken, who maybe has not filled out a slip or had a slip slip from my hand? If so, now's your chance. Raise your hand or I'm going to close public testimony at this point. Once, twice. All right, thank you very much. Everyone who spoke, thank you for being concise, staying on time. And uh, we actually did this quicker than most people anticipated. And that's thanks to you folks who have come and stayed engaged. So moving on, uh, we now are into the discussion part. And again, the things we're going to discuss tonight are the increased, increasing the minimum separation to the principal structures of 3,250 feet from non-participating property lines, change the noise limits to 39 dBA, and add a noise limit of 80 dBC for infrasound. Before we get to that, uh, we did get some other input late. I think Mary has uh, an email I'd like read into the record by her so that it can become part of tonight's Thanks, evidence. Eric. Uh, this is from Robin and Ryan Fellers, and they say, we want the committee to know it has our full support with regard to expanding wind power generation in Champaign County. It has been well documented that burning fossil fuels is leading to catastrophic climate disaster. We must transition away from fossil fuels to renewable energy sources as soon as possible to avoid climate change's most disastrous effects. Wind energy is a clean fuel source. It doesn't emit particulate matter or contribute to the greenhouse gases that warm our planet. Additionally, wind power doesn't need large amounts of water to keep plants cool, which makes it even gentler on the environment. Wind is a sustainable power source. As long as the sun shines and the earth rotates, wind will be here, ready to be utilized as clean energy for the world. Wind power is economically sound, not requiring large subsidies from the government to keep it viable. Thanks to Mother Nature, the fuel is free and it is not dependent upon the variability of fuel prices upon which traditional sources of power depend. The wind power industry will create jobs in manufacturing, installation, and the maintenance of wind farms. Rural economies can particularly benefit from wind power creation. Farmers can rent out small pieces of their property for turbines while continuing to farm the rest of their land. And since wind is a domestic source of power, it contributes to our national security. As residents of Champaign County, we would love to see wind fully embraced as an energy source. It is clean, sustainable, and economically viable. Please do all you can to expand its use. Thank you. We also have before us both ZBA and ELOC members a packet that staff has put together that starts with the hankered environmental. Um, I'm just going to point out a few things that are in it so that you know there's been discussion. I'm sure we'll discuss more what's in the hankered environmental. Uh, we received, uh, and they have Susan's name up at the top. Uh, it looks like two emails from uh, Isaac Simmers. Uh, and uh, they are in support of following the WHO noise limits. They talk about fossil fuels. Uh, they talk about their revenue from wind power, and uh, they're in support of Those wind. are forwarded from ESAC. Yeah, they were forwarded, yeah. Um, the Brookfield Renewables uh, sent us uh, information from Ben uh, Malerny, uh, who also spoke tonight, and that is in there. And I recommend everyone read that in both bodies. The Iron Workers Union 380 uh, spelled my name in an interesting way, but I'll take it. Uh, and they sent an email that is in the record. It came yesterday. Uh, they are in support. Can I ask why these are being read in? I'm not reading the whole thing in. I'm just we, pointing them out. We all have them. There's okay. other documents that and we can all read. For the audience to know, I want them to they know. They can go online and read them too. Just like every other I I'm going to Eric has the floor point. right now, sir. Yeah. The, uh, uh, from Adani Sanchez, we got a letter of support from Matthew Frank. Uh, we got one of support with char chart 
and Yusuf Shah also sent that. So, uh, and the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers came tonight, about an hour before five there. So, so all of that stuff is available for everyone to read, and uh, the ZBA member is correct, it is online as well. Uh, moving on to the discussion phase, uh, again, I haven't seen this in years, sorry. Um, we are here to talk about those three things. I think I will open it up uh, to ZBA members first. If there's anything you want to add about uh, how you came to your decisions or anything you want to talk about that was said in public comment tonight or anything that you want to respond to in any of the correspondence we got, uh, I'll let you sort of lead that discussion with your membership and then we'll move over to ELOC membership and then we'll have input from everybody. So. I'll let you uh, run this part of the meeting. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I guess starting from furthest away from me, Mr. Bates. Up, oh, up. Oh. Mr. Randall. I get this because I've been here the longest. Uh, I think that we spent numerous hours uh, going through this, listening to uh, everyone and uh, having their, listen, their opinions, uh, looking at material presented to us. Uh, I will say that uh, there was maybe one person that uh, came before the board that was uh, speaking in favor of the uh, windmills period and after all the hours that we put into this. And when it comes down to this, why we have six or eight, ten people that uh, now uh, want to voice their opinions. Whenever we went through all of the evidence, and uh, we're not against the wind farms at all, but we figure that uh, we're representing a huge area of the population where this uh, particular wind farm is uh, proposed, um, and this can happen anywhere else in the state. This area is uh, pretty heavily populated, and uh, so we just felt that we need to protect the desires of the individuals living in this area, and to come <clears throat> in with the, uh, the, the distances. Uh, I've been around the windmills. Uh, I wouldn't want to be there having one uh, right next door to me. But whenever you talk about having a setback from, uh, from the residents, uh, if somebody owns uh, more than an acre, more than three acres, uh, they own 15 or 20, they may not always want to have their home in one particular area where the existing home is. Uh, could be destroyed by a fire, could be destroyed by any nature of God. Uh, and this would, by using the uh, setbacks at uh, the residence, uh, was, would eliminate uh, them being able to uh, build a home somewhere else on their property uh, without going through... Uh, bunch of uh, uh, restriction changes um, and so what we just you know feel that it should be by from the property line of the, rather than by residence uh, the heights uh, just because uh, some manufacturer wants to start building uh, six or seven hundred feet high wind turbines or have no limit 
on the height that they want to, uh, that's, that's uh, awfully broad-minded, uh, open-ended. That could happen. Uh, who knows what uh, changes would come place uh, 10 or more years down the road. So uh, we'd, we strongly feel that the uh, staying below the 500 feet is uh, the best way to uh, protect the citizens in this particular area uh, or anywhere else in the state, or in the county, rather. Uh, <clears throat> All right, and just uh, a reminder for other folks, we're not actually talking about the height today. Uh, that's not on the agenda to talk about. The 499 is still in place uh, with the uh, what came from ZBA, and that was not brought up in discussion in ELOC at the moment. Uh, so go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Randall. Mr. Herbert. I think all this was brought forth in four meetings. We had four meetings on this, and we've spent a lot of time on it. These are the recommendations that we've thought to add. A lot has changed in the past several years. Um, you know, things get bigger. You know, coming from an ag background, farm equipment gets bigger and bigger every year. We're not making roads wider. I, I just don't think that we need to... The, the, the separation on this, and I, I support the uh, property line because that does hit home a little bit and, and back to my original thought the four meetings I see several of these spaces repeat you know they've came to every meeting and spent their time to come and listen to this and 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 a lot of these people that's their livelihood and and the property lines is that that's a big one you know it's not just my house and and Property is, they'll make more of it. You know, there's not more land coming up for sale or, or being made. It only comes up for sale. And that price is going up, up, and up. I might want one of my daughters to build on a piece of my property that, you know, when, when that time comes, I, I don't know, when that time comes, that may limit me if it's not from my property line. Um, and the noise, I think, I think it's important to protect every every individual. Um, that noise may not affect everyone the same, but the ones it does, I think their their voice matters as well. Um, infrasound or just flat out noise. Um, we we spent a lot of time reading that. I've seen a stack of papers to sift through and read through and gather my information from. Um, I support all this stuff. I think I think this is this is our agreement. This is where we came to and, and I think I think that's where it should stand. Thank you, Mr. Herbert. Mr. Bates. So just to make sure we're all aware of how this was brought up. This was brought up at ELUC. This isn't anything that ZBA has brought up. It was put forth in front of us to listen to you all. And as it's been stated, there may have been one in support. So I question why now, after a joint meeting that's been unprecedented, set up, 50, has not been done in 50 years, we have all of a sudden so many people, people speaking out in favor. Where were they when public testimony was available? Who is reaching out to these individuals all of a sudden, or why do they all of a sudden feel like they need to come forth? Where were they at the meeting for public hearing? That's a great question, huh? So again, ZBA did not bring this to the table. We listened to the constituents we sifted through the mounds of paperwork. We put countless hours into this, not just here, but at home. Reading through the materials that was presented to us. We sent a recommendation based off the facts that were provided to us, to the people that came out and spoke. 
That's how we came to our decision. Thank you, Mr. Bates. Mr. Roberts. Uh, I voted along with uh, the rest of the ZBA board, and we sent the information to you guys, and I, it's in your court. I don't know what else to say or what else to do. Uh, the gentleman preceding me um, spoke very eloquently ab ab about what has happened, and uh, I don't know what else to add. We made our decision. We sent it to you. And like I said, the ball's in your court, I guess, Mark. Thank you, Mr. Roberts. Mr. Anderson. The um, infrastructure part of this um, recommendation um, I ADDB sort of um, hung him by head. Um, so uh, I I, um, I I feel that um, while it's a great great big number, and uh, the um, wind turbines that make this m much noise um, certainly should be a um, um, hundred miles away. Um, the um, newer wind tunnels, uh, wind turbines may um, make may more infrastructure noise. And I'm speaking of zero through 20 cycles per second, or hertz. Um, the uh, new um, uh, wind turbines may make more noise of the uh, infrastructure um, of variety. Um, and I, I put this in uh, for um, so we don't forget about the uh, when the uh, infrastructure uh, noise. You can't hear infrastructure noise. Me, most people can't. Um, but nonetheless, your body senses it. Um, and um, your body re reacts to it. And your house and your um, a a animals um, respond to it. Um, and so uh, I, I, um, uh, I insisted that they, that, that there be um, um, a, 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 a saying Party. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Mr. Wood. Well, as other members of the board have already pointed out, uh, we went through a lot of information, uh, starting with you know I've read the uh, the assessment that was done by uh, for the California Ridge by uh, the individual that wrote us a note uh, here recently from uh, Hankard, I think is the name. Uh, 
and uh, Dr. Schomer's name was also on that on that uh, publication. Uh, <clears throat> and I didn't notice that uh, there was much of a, an issue at, at that for that particular publication, but uh, that was done quite a few years ago. Uh, I believe it was back in 2013 or 2014. Uh, there have been subsequent publications that uh, that we've read through, and the, you know I've got most of them here. Uh, <clears throat> the one for Livingston County that Dr. Schomer did uh, uh, several years later pointed out the fact that uh, you really don't get rid of the annoyance factor for everybody until you get out to past 3,000 feet, uh, which is you know the noise issue that that you have. That's the audible part of it. Uh, there really isn't a whole lot of information around the infrastructure issue, uh, <clears throat> uh, infrasound issue, uh, but the uh, uh, the information that I've been able to pick up on that would suggest that uh, it really starts to become annoying when you get up around sixty to seventy five. 65 to 75 uh, uh, DBC, uh, <clears throat> and you need that because it's something that's not audible. Uh, it's something that you need a lot more energy to create that uh, before it actually starts having a physical effect on the body. Uh, whether or not it's a criteria that really needs to be established, uh, and whether or not, but I, my my gut feeling is is that when you have multiple wind <clears throat> wind turbines uh, in an area, you're probably going to get interference uh, uh, between those wind turbines and where you're going to create uh, both uh, points where they cancel each other out and other points where they add together. Uh, so you're going to end up with points with uh, more excessive energy. The, uh, the other thing that, se second thing that really uh, affected my my choice of having this type of uh, uh, having this type of setback and limiting it to not so much the height uh, so much but uh, but the separation distances uh, is because of the population <coughs> uh, that we've got here Illinois or Champaign County is the fourth largest in terms of population of of the 102 counties in Champaign in, in Illinois uh, there are 90 other counties that have considerably less population density uh, that, that are available. Uh, and putting uh, uh, towers out here uh, at some point is just going to, uh, uh, for one, it'll slow the growth of any residences, residential areas out in those areas. You just won't be able, without, without violating the, uh, the setback rule, you won't be able to, uh, to uh, uh, put, build any more houses out there uh, once that's installed. Uh, so that is certainly a concern of mine. Uh, <clears throat> I don't think bigger is better. Uh, I would suggest that uh, given what I've been through in the last 40 years with uh, respect to technology and the way it's uh, been changing, it's only been 120 years since we were riding high on, on horses and buggies, you know, and, and uh, technology has been changing at what we call an exponential rate. Uh, <clears throat> it seems like it's a fairly linear process when you go through most of the 1900s, but when you get into the 1990s and, and uh, computers start uh, start uh, uh, being developed like they are, then you get into what, uh, in a, if you understand an exponential function, uh, it kind of moves like this and then it, then it takes off uh, vertically. And uh, that part where it starts to curve upward is where we are. We're in the knee of that exponential curve. And uh, technology is changing so fast these days, you all know, you change your phones once every two or three years. Uh, uh, all the other technology that's affecting every part of, of this, and it's going to affect <clears throat> the way we procure energy. You can put up these wind farms, <clears throat> and I can tell you, <clears throat> I would not sign a 90-year contract for this kind of stuff because the technology that's going into these things right now will probably be obsolete in 10 years. And there'll be other things that'll be taking its place. Uh, <clears throat> and hopefully those things will be more benign. Uh, personally, I'm, you know, I feel a whole lot more comfortable with solar. I have a 10K system on my 
on my house. I've had it there for five years. I don't have I don't have an energy bill to speak of uh, from a, from an electric from the electrical perspective. <clears throat> I do have to pay a little bit for propane, but uh, even so, you know uh, what I've invested in for solar, you know. Uh, there, there's better things out there now in solar panels just in the last five years and what it's created. Uh, so I, I don't know that I would <clears throat> want to put too much uh, uh, investment into uh, this type of thing, which is really large and and uh, we don't know <clears throat> we don't know all the things that uh, the, or the impacts that it can have on on our health. Uh, there's there's a lot of case studies out there for people. Uh, and not just Ted Hartke, but a lot of others that uh, where people have just moved out of their houses because of the impact of it. Now, obviously, some people are going to be more sensitive than others uh, in, in this respect. Uh, uh, there's going to be a certain percentage of the population that are going to be affected by it, <clears throat> more so than, than, than the, the rest of the population. But I think you have to take that into consideration. And uh, <clears throat> if... Uh, uh, Schomer's work here and this thing here suggests that, you know, in order to in order to make sure that you're protecting everybody uh, to to the extent that you can uh, from the noise and hopefully from the from any any impact from the infrasound uh, is that you uh, <clears throat> is that you uh, 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 get that se separation out there out to around three thousand feet in order to guarantee that. <clears throat> if you don't do that, then I think you put a lot of people at risk uh, that that don't deserve to be at risk. Uh, when you look at some of the other areas around us, uh, uh, live, uh, McLean County, for example, I mean, they've got a couple of wind farms up there now. That I think they're planning on putting in a couple more. Uh, <clears throat> but you have to realize that Livingston County has uh, about 200 additional square miles of space, and it also has 40,000 fewer people, okay? which means the population density is considerably less, okay? Vermilion County over here, and you can see from, from this map here that there's lots of turbines out there, but Vermilion County has about 50 square miles more than Champaign County, but it only has 46% of the population. You know, the population over there is somewhere in the neighborhood of around 45,000. You know, it's, it's considerably less. So <clears throat> the... I. I'm not against wind power as it is. Uh, I, I don't. I, I, there's information that I've read that you know getting taller isn't necessarily with with new advancements and uh, and being able to generate energy that you don't necessarily need to go taller. Uh, but <clears throat> uh, the uh, uh, the the most important thing I think is is that separation of that distance. One concern that I had, which was men mentioned earlier by someone else. You know, establishing that limit at 39 dBA and whether or not there's a legal issue with respect to uh, 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 whether or not all industry out in the county needs to have the same same criteria. That's that's an issue that we really need to look at, <clears throat> not just necessarily apl ap applicable to, to wind, uh, a, a particular industry, and whether or not there's some legal ramifications that might come as a result of that. Uh, so the, uh, there, there are lots of areas, and we have lots of open space in this country. There's lots of wind in this country. Uh, there are probably better places. It's not that I'm against it. It's just that, it's just that with the population density that we have in this county, you know, it puts a lot, of peop lot more people at risk. Uh, the, uh, uh, and there's, uh, I, I know that uh, uh, dealing with corporations, because I spent 40, 40 years of my life in the corporate world, I know how that works. It's all about the money. It's all it's about. And, uh, and uh, I, I would, uh, you know, if, the, if we could ensure that, uh, that they, they operate as good corporate citizens, <clears throat> that would be nice. But there's too many times in the past, in the past 50 or 60 years that, uh, that I've watched that they have not in, in too many different aspects of our of our, of our economy. So with that, I'll leave it at that. That's my perspective on, on where to go with this. If it doesn't work here, it just doesn't work. You know, 
uh, but there's lots of places where it will, and that's where it should go. Thank you, Mr. Wood. <laughs> I see our role as the ZBA is adjudicating um, land uses and variances, and um, especially like the text amendment coming from the elected officials that are surrounding us right now. Um, my personal thoughts and feelings, I'm a small government kind of guy. Um, I'd prefer to have everyone to be good human beings. Um, but I know that that's not always going to be the case. And that's why um, our board is, is here. Um, personally speaking, I didn't think that the current ordinance was broke. And we, um, to my knowledge, there has been no, um, in it, maybe Mr. Hall can, uh, can update this, but as of last meeting, uh, there were no complaints about the California Ridge um, wind farms. And so, you know, I, I, you, Mr. Chair, uh, were sitting in my position when these original um, ordinances were being drafted. And I can only imagine that there was quite a bit of, of labor, quite a bit of, of testimony that were digested. And um, I can only imagine that there was as much passion for property rights and stuff like that. Um, so I, honestly, like, I don't know the reasons why this was wanting to go back to the ZBA, but it was. Um, the other thing is, last night, my Chesapeake Bay Retriever was on my bed, and he was snoring. And I have an app on my phone, and I'm not a scientist when it comes to ask petition or whatever, but my phone said that he was snoring at between 40 and 41 dBA. Um, I didn't like that. I kicked him off the bed, and it was still at 40. Um, I honestly don't know too much about infrasound, and I, I, I was not on board with um, like adding that type of, of language. Um, I didn't feel comfortable um, even knowing what I'm asking for kind of thing. But the one thing that I do support is the role of RZBA, and it's to take the information that is provided to us and to listen to the people that have taken their time. And there was an overwhelming amount of, of information that supported an increase in the... Um, in the distance, the kicking the dog off the bed, so increasing the a, a, to the thirty nine dBA, and if there was any, I don't remember, and I, I could be corrected, um, but I don't believe that there was any person that testified to um, like it, all the evidence was on, on one side of the pendulum and there was nothing on the other side and I'm the type of person that I want everything out in front of me I want to know what I'm putting on my plate and then let me decide and um, from the information that we did receive um, it, it was on one side or the other. And when we made our recommendation to um, 
uh, to your board. Um, uh, apparently, it wasn't the recommendation that um, that was like to be heard, I guess. And that this is the reason why that, that we're having this informational meeting is to be able to give the insight of the evidence that we heard and to give the insight of what the board had to say and what our deliberations were. And, you know, like, I know Mr. Thorson knows um, quite a bit about, you know, like how much work goes into the ZBA. And um, I would have to say that I'm not quite as familiar with, um, you know, like a, with the amount of work that goes into the ELUC committee, but I can only imagine that it, it's quite a bit as well. Um, but there was quite a bit of work that went into this, and I, I don't want this to be, you know, like just I just brushed off. So, um, thank you very much for your guys' time. I greatly appreciate the um, the interest in hearing us out. Um, we certainly don't have a voice here. We don't have a vote here, but I really do appreciate you. Um, taking your time and, and listening to all of us. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, some background before I turn it over to ELOC members and then members of the board that are here present as well. Uh, yes, uh, I'm very aware of what goes into a wind farm ordinance because I had to act as chair. Uh, the chair of the ZBA, when I was a, a young member of it, at some point I was young, uh, had a letter of agreement with the wind farm company and therefore had to abstain from the meetings. So I got put in the role of running those public hearings for the original ordinance in Champaign County. It was mentioned earlier on that I felt ours was one of the more restrictive. At the time, the counties around us, and in particular, we knew California Ridge was coming. Uh, Vermilion County had no ordinance. And this was a very common thing 12, 13 years ago. They were just basically building permits they made a deal with a landowner. Uh, there was no real guidance. And the wind towers started to go up. And so in that respect, Champaign County put a lot of work. And I, you know the work the ZBA does. And then therefore, you know the work that staff does. Uh, an amazing amount of work that staff did to gather all the information. Uh, we had lots of public hearings. If I recall, I think it was six meetings or five meetings. They were long four-hour meetings. And we didn't do any discussion until after at least four or five of those was all public input. Uh, and as you know, we let everyone speak in ZBA as long as they want to. And we took that all into consideration and we came up with the original ordinance. And then not long after that, California Ridge Invenergy applied under those guidelines. And eventually we went through those hearings and all the work that the staff did and all the work that ZBA did and it went through ELOC and it went to the county board and it was passed all the way through. And that ordinance worked as evidence that there's 30 towers and that there's been relatively few problems with it. Uh, you notice that a lot of public input and testimony that came before you talked about other counties. Um, they talked about Douglas, they talked about Vermillion, they talked about Ford, they had a lot of problems up in Ford. Uh, and we didn't hear a lot about Champaign County. We also didn't see a lot of new applications. And there was a couple reasons for that, and they weren't all because of the ordinance. Uh, it's true, wind power is subsidized. It's not subsidized like the fossil fuel industry is. It's not subsidized like ethanol energy is. But it is subsidized, and those subsidies went almost completely away, unlike the fossil fuel industry. So wind companies didn't want to invest, and so we didn't see a lot. The impetus to send to you sort of an idea to update it, and I apologize because I think we sort of gave you a very blank slate. And with that, uh, and with you know the, the public input and a blank slate and the word unlimited was probably frightening and more frightening than it needed to be. There's a physical limit to the height of these towers mechanically. Uh, 
uh, that maybe the technology will be different in the future and they'll be taller, but there's sort of a physical limit to a monopole wind tower and the metal that makes the tower. Uh, they will not be two miles high, I don't think, ever in our lifetime. They may be 600 feet high, which is about 100 over ours. California Ridge wants to put new blades on at some point, and they will violate our ordinance because they'll be above the 499, and we'll have to do a waiver that will come through you uh, if that is to be successful. So we sent it to you with some things uh, that we had some guidance, which you adopted, and we have no complaints. The advanced lighting system, I think, is an upgrade that we needed in our ordinance. It came from the FAA. Uh, the FAA puts no limit on a tower height, but they put different conditions on the lighting for towers. And that was one of the reasons why we didn't put a height, because we thought the FAA guidelines showed what you had to do if you went higher. Uh, maybe we should have sent it to you with more guidance there. I personally think that we had the separation from participant and non-participants, and I think that was a good thing. I honestly don't think they were as far back as we know better now. I don't think that they should be as far back as what came from your recommendations, but there's some ground in between those where I think it's realistic. Uh, and that's what we wanted to get input on, is where, where do we go with that, if the towers especially get higher. Uh, we always looked at it as a factor of tower height versus distance, bigger tower, further distance. Uh, some of the advantages of bigger towers, uh, besides the fact that some of the companies that want to come in and do them, they make more energy, which means there's fewer of them, uh, which may make siting easier. Uh, but you guys were given by us, uh, maybe too blank a slate. We didn't give you enough parameters that we were really concerned about. We just kind of said, here it is. We know it's old. I think it's 12 or 13 years old. And it's obvious that, like your phone, like your car, maybe we need to update this a little bit. You talked about farm equipment getting better. We talk about these towers getting better. We talk about energy needs getting bigger. Uh, we talk about the need for more energy that doesn't make it hotter so that we need more energy because it got hotter. Uh, but we should have done a better job of giving you maybe a tighter set of conditions to work on, of things to consider, of what we thought we needed, rather than just dumping it all into ZBA and saying, okay, your turn, listen to the public, and come back with what you did. Uh, and you have. I'm going to put some things in later on because we will not finish this tonight, I'm sure, uh, that have to do with infrasound, that have to do with some studies, including the studies cited. We have, I have a copy of the Health Canada study. There's a copy of the Health Canada study in here. Uh, then I want to point out just some very basic things. The Health Canada study talks about, and I will read really, really briefly, what their conclusions were when they did a self-reported study. And people will say, okay, well, this is the beginning of it, and later on they have some other recommendations. But the following were not found to be associated with wind tower noise exposure. Self-reported sleep disturbances, medicated uh, diagnosed sleep disorders, self-reported illnesses, dizziness, tinnitus, migraines, headaches, uh, chronic health conditions, high blood pressure, diabetes, and self-reported perceived stress and quality of life. That's in the Health Canada study. I have studies about infrasound. I have things about critics. Uh, people laughed before, but I will mention uh, that, in fact, we talk a lot about bird death. We talk a lot about bat death and things. The biggest uh, problem with bird death is commercial agriculture. It's not because it kills birds, it kills their food. Uh, while we're growing food for us, we're killing food bugs, mostly. Uh, there's a lot of farms that don't use a lot of pesticide anymore. There's still enough to do. Uh, towers with glass windows kill more birds than wind towers do. Uh, and I, this study is weighted. It's not because there's less 
wind towers than there are glass towers. Domestic cats are a huge problem for birds, uh, and anyone who has a cat knows that. Uh, but there is concerns. There was one farmer who came who said that they were doing a bird study at the tower near his house, and the tower wasn't turning. And I haven't been able to find out to verify that, but that would be a very interesting thing to know. Uh, but what I do feel will need to be worked on uh, is a couple things. The, the map that John gave us that he corrected, this is the revised California Ridge, and I think everyone has this in their packet. The X's mean that with the current recommendations from ZBA, there would be zero of these in Champaign County. Now again, they've been there for about 10 years, and there's not been a lot of problems. The wind company came and showed us that this is what you get. Red means you can't. It's all red. Uh, that protects everybody from perceived and actual effects of wind power. It does nothing to generate energy. It does nothing for the landowner who may want one. I know that there is a proposed process where they could go and get good neighbor waivers and things. Uh, but during the original ordinance, I would get talked to by the farmers, but not in this room. I couldn't leave the parking lot for a long time. And so none of it was on the record. But I had one farmer tell me, give me as many as I can, as long as the tips don't hit. Because guaranteed revenue on a quarter acre of land out of production that brings you eight to $12,000, and again, this was 10 years ago, that happens every year for 30 years, whether it rains or doesn't, whether you get the, the beans in or not, they want it, but they didn't want to go on record for it. So there is support, but the support is quiet. And you found this out in your ZBA hearings. Nobody came to talk about wanting them. Nobody came who's in negotiation with a, a wind company right now, I imagine. You got the people that didn't want them or wanted very big setbacks. And you reacted and you did what you should do based on the input that you got. We see now that the issues before us, that more people have come forward, uh, the labor union, the electrical union, people who work on these things. Uh, I hope to hear from people who actually want one. Uh, people say, okay, well you live in town there, towny boy. Uh, well, I lived for 20 years in rural Newcomb Township, 480, 2500 north. Uh, I would have put as many as I could on the 40 acres that I had if I was allowed to, but no one proposed, no one approached, uh, but I would have done it within the parameters of the existing ordinance, and I could just barely fit one uh, and been happy with it. I would love to see one in West Side Park, and I would love to see another one in Hessels. I would love to see one on top of my house, but it's probably not structurally sound. Larry, you're right. Solar is a great thing, too. Uh, we will need all of it. And the zoning board listened, and the people who live there came and spoke. But the Environment Land Use Committee has to look at uh, our constituents, as well as all of the county constituents. Uh, we have reps from the area here. Stan is here, Jim is here. They're in two opposite ends of the county and the rural areas, and I look forward to hearing what they have to say, and I'm gonna shut up now. Uh, but this is how you got what you got from us, and you th should not be mistaken that we don't appreciate all the work you put into it, and we don't respect the decisions that you came to and how you arrived at those. But we're here as a study session to see if there's a way that we can come to a position where it's a little more feasible, where this isn't all X's in the future, that if our, there are people who are agreeable to wind, who want them, that we make it possible in Champaign County. We're an attractive place for it because the wind grows and we have the grid to support it, which isn't the case everywhere in Illinois or in the country right now. And the more robust the grid gets, the more we'll see the move away. The more robust our energy supply, the less likely we will see rolling brownouts and energy shortages. So I'm gonna open it up to the ELOC board 
and for either comment or questions to the zoning board members if they're willing to answer those. So I'm not going to pick on names. I'm going to let a hand come up. Aaron? Thank you. To me, the crux of the reason we're here tonight is because staff does not believe that ZBA would recommend approval should a new wind farm come before them under the current, current ordinance. The ZBA, comprised of seven members of the unincorporated part of the county, took testimony over four meetings. I made two of them. The recommendations they sent back are what they heard, are based on what they heard, are based on what they heard from the people in the unincorporated part of the county. There's the definite reason that both are, that the ZBA is the unincorporated part of the, members are made up of the unincorporated part of the county because the incorporated part of the county has their own zoning. Quite frankly, I'm not sure with the makeup of the county board that the recommended ordinance changes that came from ZBA will pass muster. But I'm also far from convinced that the ZBA can't do their job and should a wind farm come before them under the current ordinances, they can't do their job and say, yes, you can put them in. The ZBA did the hearings as were asked. They, re they made the recommendation for increased setbacks and strengthened, I'll say, noise ordinances. In other words, less noise at the property lines. There are plenty of studies, I would say, on both sides. So who do you listen to? I've heard Mr. Ted Harkey give his story multiple times. I have absolutely no reason to not believe him. Have I grown tired of hearing Mr. Harkey give his story? Yeah, I'll admit it, I have. Do sometimes I feel that his presentation could probably be better? Yes. <laughs> he says he feels like a lightning rod, he is. But I have no, absolutely no reason to not believe his story. That's his story. That ties in with, I would say, Mr. Woods saying that different people react differently, can be affected differently. I can easily believe that Mr. Harkey and his family were affected. I can easily believe maybe Mr. Harkey's next door neighbor, who let's just say he lives 100 foot closer or even 100, let's say 100 foot farther away, well, no, let's say 100 foot closer to the wind turbines, isn't affected. People react differently. Some people are more prone to skin cancer than others. Some people are just prone to cancer more than others. What the ZBA has recommended is what they are hearing from the people who live in the area that will be affected by these ordinances. ZBA was presented with testimony that I believe, except for the, what I've heard, if this is correct, there's only one turbine that has been out of the map that is floating out there for a potential new wind farm in the south of Sydney, south of Philo area, southern part of the county. There's only one turbine sited on land that is owned by someone who lives in the area. But mind you, that person doesn't live on that piece of land. They live, I've don't know, I'm going to say maybe a couple miles away from that piece of land. Otherwise, all the turbines are proposed to be sited on absentee landowner 
parcels of land. That right there, to tie in with what has been said sometimes before about business practices, tells me a little bit about the business practices. Why do they make the concerted effort to put wind turbine, possible turbines on absentee landowners parcels instead of going up to say a Mr. Learcamp and saying, hey, you've got an 80 acres here. We'd like to put a wind farm in the middle of your 80 acres. The current ordinance, I, I, it was working, I suppose, but it doesn't hurt to necessarily go back through and update. Things do change. I, for like the feet, by chance, you know, one, one that came back from the, the um, granted, we, we are supposed to be only talking about the three issues, but other people have mentioned gone off the rail of the three issues that are on the agenda. The idea of the fees. Oh, that came back from the ZBA. That I believe that part was maybe unanimous to increase the fees. Well, heck yeah, I'd agree with that. Today's day and age, the fees for decommissioning, and, or fees, for, I'm sorry, not for decommissioning necessarily, for getting them approved for all the work that the planning and zoning staff has to do, the county has to do. So... I'm not sure, like I say, I guess I'll end with this at this point in time, I'm not sure where this ends up. I guess the most that I see happening is maybe we just live with what we have for right now as far as the setbacks and the noise limits. However, that is not what the county I will say the county, not just the ZBA, that is not what the county is hearing from the people who live in the county in the possible area that would be affected. They are saying we want increased setbacks and sufficient noise protection, be it infrasound or audible. The citizens have spoken. I think it's pretty clear. That is what they want. The ZBA responded accordingly in my book. For the county board or even ELUC to send, send back because ELUC is the policy-making um, organization. ZBA basically does the dirty work of the hearings. But for the, for the present um, way that ELEC and the county board as a whole are made up, I'm not sure that the recommendations from ZBA will ever, will ever get sent back to them to go through another hearing or hearings, however many it takes. But the ZBA did what they were supposed to do. And I'm okay with that. And I'm okay with the idea that we should go to these increased setbacks and strengthened noise limits, regulations, I should say. And that's my thoughts at this point in time. Thanks. Stephanie? Um, so first, I appreciate the work of the ZBA and everybody who came out here today um, to talk about their, their thoughts on this issue. Um, I'm gonna, I think that I, I like what you said about that ZBA has to do the dirty work, but then we're the policy board. Uh, we have to come up with a policy. And I think any time you think about a policy, like this, and the many factors that you have to weigh. The expectations of local residents versus um, 
in my opinion, what is one of the greatest crises of our time, in my opinion, one of our greatest crises of our time, climate change. How you navigate that and what our responsibility is as elected officials. And I think what it comes down to is that our responsibility as elected officials is to try to do the most good for the most people and to mitigate harm to people in the minority. But it's important that we mitigate actual harm, not perceived harm. And so when, and I appreciate that you only heard evidence on a particular side of the issue, but for me, and I have reviewed everything that the ZBA has looked at, uh, I've you know, looked into this, looked into the, to the people that they're citing in this, actually analyzing what you're getting is incredibly important. So just let me give you just one example, the one that I find the most egregious. In the piece, that, the PowerPoint that you have from Dr. Punch, he relies heavily on Nina Pierpoint's 2009 study about wind turbine syndrome, a study which has widely been disbunked, um, if that's even a word, in the scientific community that was not properly peer reviewed. She didn't actually talk to actually visit with anybody in person who she said had all these negative impacts. That study is the basis, the rubric by which Dr. Punch is doing his analysis. And it's just that kind of thing where you look at, if you just even curse, give a cursory analysis of the actual scientific, there is some disagreement, but it's not widespread disagreement. Like what we have before us is cherry picked evidence on a particular side. And, and that could be on the, the, the responsibility of the fact that other members of the public didn't come, only pay consultants from a particular, you know, relying on science from a particular viewpoint. But, I mean, just some of it is just, has just been disbunked. I mean, it just, if you want to know what Nina Pierpont is up to now, she is out there basically questioning the efficacy of COVID vaccines and is being used widely on internet conspiracy theory websites. And that's like the basis, like if you go back and then you look at some of the other studies, that's what they're basing it on, right? And so like, I get that you heard a lot of evidence, but you also have to look at the, the, the weight of that evidence. And to me, I think that's why I was really glad that we had to have this conversation. So in particularly the infrasound piece, like I appreciate that you said, Ryan, that that was the piece that maybe gave you the most pause because like, that's the piece that gives me the most pause. I definitely don't want there to be harm to our rural communities, but like we have to have a real conversation about what is the harm. And if you look at lawsuits around health issues, they've been dismissed. If you look at actual studies about property value, they do not reflect the perceived fear of what people are saying. It just, it hasn't happened. And so at some point, do I have to weigh the perception of harm or actual harm. And it's our job as people in these positions to figure out is there actual harm? And there isn't, there just isn't. I'd put, a, if I, I live two blocks from Westside Park, I would absolutely put a windmill in Westside Park if somebody would let me. Stephanie has the floor. So. Um, that's, I just wanted to share what my opinion, my thoughts were on these kind of things. Um, but I think it's very, very important that when we have a conversation about harm, that we ground it in actual discussions of things that exist in the world. And I, and I don't feel like sometimes the conversations that we have do, and if not, if there is not actual harm, then in my opinion, and this is actually something that I is not usually something from my side of the aisle, I think that property owners should have the right to do with their property what they want. If there is not actual harm that is going to come from those decisions. 
I don't think it is the job of the government to intervene into situations that do not cause actual harm. And despite the fact that I've read this package and read, gone online and read many of the things that they cite, I do not think that they have evidentially proved actual harm and it is not therefore our business to be regulating a harm that simply does not exist. Any other members of ELOP? Members of the board? Dan? Well, I'm sure you've all heard where I fall on this issue, and as Mr. Bates mentioned, uh, I, uh, I was at at least two of the hearings. I listened to a lot of testimony, not as much as the zoning board people did. Uh, so I'm going to keep my comments basically simple. Two things. In the whole scope of agriculture, when you take in the research, the companies, the seed, the universities, the unions that produce our products and manufacture it, Teamsters at Hollis, agriculture has and always will be the economic driver for this county. And these people don't want wind farms in the middle of it. Other members of the board? Okay. What do we got, Jim? Wasn't sure if you were waving it away or if you were just waving. No, because I could probably talk for the next three hours about the evil of wind, wind farms. Because I have clients that have chosen, they are, they're property owners and they've chosen wind farms. They've chosen, I've, I manage farms with 14 wind turbines on them. I can tell you, you know, we had, we had a bunch of very smart attorneys in Ford County that thought they were going to beat the wind farms. They wanted production leases because they thought the wind farms were going to, they were taking the money away. And what, what happens there is if these wind farms were such a great thing, why in the world am I getting less money every year than what I would have gotten originally? Because the, if they can't sell the energy that's needed, supposedly, they turn them off. They systematically, they're all computerized, they turn them off because they're not going to let them spin up there. Hey, it's a business, I get it. But don't tell me that there's this unbelievable shortage and I was just through Paxton the other day and probably a third of them were shut off now okay why why is that they can't all be under maintenance and if they are that's that's a problem with that California Ridge classic example I've never seen a wind farm that's got more turbines down all the time saw one where they took the actual Looked like it had wrapped the blade around the turbine. I don't know if the brakes failed in a storm. I don't know what it is. I've seen blades thrown over there. Now, I don't know how far it threw the blade because all I saw was drug back up by the, by the uh, turbine, by the, by the post, whatever you want to call the, the stanchion. So I don't know how far they found that out in somebody's field. I sure as hell wouldn't want to live next to them. I don't, I don't have any desire to live next to them. I, in those 14, I can hear them a half a mile away because I'm out walking, scouting corn, and on a windy day. Mind you, almost all of mine are less than 2 megawatts. 1.65 because they're the old McLean County ones. Even the ones, I think the ones in uh, Ford County might be 2.3s. They were really early stuff. And you can hear them a half a mile away when I'm walking through corn over my head. So don't tell me that 1,200 feet's enough. It's just not. It's ridiculous. The fact that you guys sent this, I, I agree. 
I wholeheartedly agree. The fact that you even sent something that had an unspecified height was ridiculous. It's lazy. It's it's dumb. Because we're, we're took, talking about 600 foot turbines now, or tip heights, in McLean County. That jumped in the last two years. And yeah, I, I hope, I hope like Mr. Wood said, I hope the technology gets a lot better. I hope they can go back to something reasonable. Because this is not reasonable. These people that didn't want to live, they don't want to live there. I man unfortunately I manage property for absentee owners. But I've not once in working with a local attorney and spending twenty-five thousand dollars in legal fees, not once have we been able to come to a reasonable agreement on a new wind lease. Because those leases are one sided as hell. They protect the wind companies, they do not protect the landowner or the leaseholder. The person that's getting paid, your protection is you get paid. You don't have good response. We had, we had a, two family members that changed. They went from a family limited partnership and when mom and dad both passed, they got all the estates cleaned up. They wanted to split out. One son got one wind farm or one wind tower. Another son got the other wind tower. That transfer happened in 2020. We, they have been holding wind payments since then because they haven't done the legal work. I'm paying, I don't know, probably 50 bucks a month for an attorney to call them every single month to do their job. And all they have to do is switch. They were in a family limited partnership. They were named in the family limited partnership. They split out into individual individuals. And they haven't done their job. That's the response you get from wind companies. They show up, they blow in there, and they blow out of there. The people that build them, they're never to be seen again. They sell two or three times. They'll sell again because it's a an economic factor. All they do is run an algorithm. I own it for this period of time. Somebody else buys it here. I discount it. I sell it. That's the way. You're never going to have the same owner. It's not going to be. It's not going to be the case. This, it's ridiculous at the way that they bastardize the rural community. It's ridiculous. And they, if the people do not hire attorneys and spend tons of money. Oh, 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 by the way, the wind company is going to offer you $750. That covers two hours worth of legal fees. It's absolutely ridiculous. Aaron said exactly what I think. ZBA is there for zoning in the rural areas. You all who live in town have your own zonings. There's a reason you don't have a wind tower in Westside Park. There's a reason you don't have one on the quad. Because it's not going to be allowed. Your, your municipalities won't allow it. That's why it's there. The, the ZBA did their work. I think we need to respect that. And we need to respect the citizens that live in the rural part of this county. Because they're the ones that are putting food on your table. Thank you, Jim. I appreciate your input. There is, uh, I remind people, the ordinance isn't uh, does nothing with the personal negotiations between the landowner and the wind companies. Uh, that's not an area that we do anything with. Uh, that's up to them. Uh, a little off topic from what we're talking about, but I know where you're going with what you were saying. Uh, sort of uh, to point of character. We're trying to stick to these particular things. Chris? Thank you, Chair Patterson. Thank you, uh, people serving on the Zoning Board of Appeals. I, the long meetings and, and difficult con considerations are, I, I respect each and every one of them and appreciate the, the hard work that you do 
in that regard. And and I, I agree with my colleague, Stephanie, that, yep, you guys kind of get to do the dirty work, hold the hearings. I, uh, I too, have been uh, getting feedback from uh, colleagues and seeking uh, advice. I, I, I have, I, I really don't like most of the papers that I read on this. I, it doesn't seem like good engineering studies to me. Uh, but, uh, and to, to Mr. Uh, Gross's point, uh, Goss's point, I, I've heard complaints similar to what you said and and uh, about the uh, about the sales and then the sale of contracts and and difficulties in dealing with companies. But again, as Mr. Thorslin said, that's not the purview of our committee. Uh, one thing that that did kind of uh, raise my uh, attention, and it has to do with the three points actually, is that. Uh, uh, we, we're looking at how the uh, noise might affect uh, human beings, but uh, we've had, uh, at least on one occasion, possibly two, a veterinary who's come here and, and talked about the effect on animals, which is something that's a bit unknown. And that is a, a something of a matter of concern for me because uh, uh, unlike many of the folks that grew up in Illinois, I grew up in Missouri and and we don't really do corn and soybeans, we do cattle and chickens and hogs. And uh, I and 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 those critters do uh, uh, have, suffer things a little differently than, than humans do and it's kind of difficult to kind of tell how these uh, noise values are going to affect them. The and uh, one of uh, one of the early uh, folks here uh, talked about the uh, problems of the wind turbines interfering with the ability to spray uh, and seed uh, fields. Uh, this kind of is 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 also something that not specifically addressed uh, in, in the in the matters that we're considering but is going to definitely have an effect on the uh, management of cover crops that said uh, looking at the uh, at, at, at the literature such as it is, uh, the at least one uh, uh, writer from the Denmark study said that they could find no health effects that could be uh, attributed to the wind turbines. No human health effects. They found that there was annoyance, but not a health effect. That that's worth uh, that that that's an important distinction. An annoyance that that uh, prevents you from sleeping might might be called a health effect, but mostly these were annoyances. And I I don't I I I just I, I it's if it's not something as Ms. Furtado said that that's affecting health. An annoyance is is just that. Uh, and I conclude my mumblings. Thank you, Chris. Anyone else from the board? Elop, Mary? So I'd like to also thank ZBA for all the work you guys did on this. I know that 
having to listen to hours and hours of testimony is is never very much fun because you people usually don't come and talk to you because they're happy or they're agreeable with what's happening. So I know that it takes a lot out of you. Whoa, hello. It takes a lot out of you. Okay. I just wonder if somebody's is on. Thanks. So anyway, basically what I want to say is that to get back to the actual discussion of what we're trying to, to amend here, the authorization, I guess what I worry about the most is that it would seem that we can't, if we can't come to some kind of agreement or an ordinance that allows for both people to feel like their needs are being met and wind farms to feel like they can come and develop, then this is just going to accelerate the state of Illinois making an overarching law and taking it out of the county's hands entirely. Because if a county like Champaign can't come to a reasonable wind ordinance, then who can? So I think that's really something to keep in mind here that as it stands right now, we're saying that wind cannot come to Champaign County. And if that happens, then the, the ability for us to make those decisions will just be taken out of our hands. Anyone else from the board or Eli? Stephanie? I, mean, I, I think Mary brings up a really important point. There was already a bill in the last cycle to take this decision out of our hands. I personally submitted a witness slip against that bill, even though that bill would promote wind in the state and in our county because I think that those decisions should be done locally. I actually do think that zoning decisions should be done locally as much as possible. However, if, as Mary said, if a county like Champaign cannot come up with an ordinance that actually balances the need for renewable energy and the property rights and lived experiences of people in our rural communities, that decision is going to be taken out of our hand. It is. The writing is on the wall. And I'm just going to be blunt. The recommendations of the ZBA do not get us there. I, no matter what you say, oh, you know, you could go negotiate individually with property owners, this will be read on a state level. It will be understood as us putting out a sign that says, wind don't come here. And it will be, and I really do think this, it will be a step closer to that decision being taken out of our local community's hands. And we, what we're going to end up having, and I'm, what we're going to end up having is that we're not going to be ha able to have meetings like this anymore because it's going to be decided at a state level. Yeah, before you start, Aaron, uh, the ZBA members have sort of a three-hour time limit, uh, and we've approached that. Uh, I don't want to stop this meeting in a screeching halt right now because I want to. I think we need to make a decision about when the next one will be, uh, because clearly we'll probably have another one. Uh, but Ryan, uh, they're they're your folks. It's your board. Uh, are you willing to stay another fifteen minutes or so? Do I have a motion from the board to extend? It. Okay. So, fifteen minutes isn't going to solve anything. But fifteen minutes would give us an opportunity to chat about the next meeting date. Mr. Chair, do you think we could do this in ten minutes? Yeah, we'll try to do it in five. Uh, Aaron, okay, Aaron is backed away. I think, yeah, I think unless there's a board member who's here tonight who has no ability to ever come back, uh, raise your hand and do your, your five minutes. If not, I think we need to look at scheduling this and uh, another joint meeting I think is, is good uh, because I think we've had Good dialogue here tonight. We've got a lot of rationale from you folks. You're hearing where we're coming from. Uh, 
and we can uh, try to work together to resolve this in some way that's acceptable to everyone, including all of you in the room. Uh, so John has got the calendar out. Uh, and I, I will start with the caveats that we don't have typically anything but a county board meeting in July, and that's because staff and board members and everybody doesn't want to do this three or four times a month, every month. Uh, I would suggest, because we have an ordinance in place, there's not a rush to do this uh, and interrupt people's summertime. Uh, maybe we want to look at September early. September 1 is a, um, an open Thursday. There's no, scheduled, there's no scheduled meeting on September 1. It was the same way with the meeting room tonight. Well, this was a ZBA scheduled meeting, but uh, I think September 1 is the next, next available joint study session date. Okay. Would the ZBA folks tentatively think that that's an open time for you? That's not even a ZBA meeting, right? Correct. That's a, an open Thursday? Uh, I, I'm going to defer to you, Ryan. If you would rather do a joint meeting with you folks on the ZBA on a night that you would normally meet anyway, depending upon what the caseload is at ZBA, and I know that fluctuates this time of year, if it was, you know, rather than add a meeting to yours, we're, we're adding one to ours, but we're, we're happy to do that at ELOC and the other board members. But if you want to not add a meeting, then it would be the week after, right? Uh, actually, it'd be September 15th. September 15th. Would you want to do this on a meeting that's your normal meeting night? We'll run it the same way. If you can handle the caseload at ZBA by having a night you don't have a meeting in September? We don't have anything scheduled. Does that for seem like a 15th? reasonable schedule? Then we're not making you folks come listen to us blather on an extra night. Mr. Chair, personally speaking, I think that this needs to be the focus of the meeting. Um, so um, it would be my recommendation, and gentlemen, correct me if I'm wrong, September 1st sounds like a, a good time to continue with this conversation. My only worry with that is that's Labor Day weekend. And so if somebody is planning a long Labor Day weekend, I'm not, but other people might be. That. You know, that Thursday might be a difficult night, the 15th. Everybody's back in school. You're not harvesting yet, unless it's a fantastically great year. Uh, or your wheat is really, really late. Uh, so I would lean to the 15th, I think, because everybody's settled into their fall schedule there. And this doesn't add an extra meeting for you guys. So there's nothing on the docket for the 15th? Okay. Um, my opinion is still this needs to be the sole focus of the, of the conversation. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I do understand what you're uh, referring to about the, uh, the holiday. Uh, but if the 15th, if there's nothing on the docket there, I, I, I think that that would be a good date to okay. continue this conversation. All right. I think that we'll tentatively schedule this for everybody in the public. And again... Fill out the attendance sheet if you haven't, because then you'll get a notice of this meeting and the time. And uh, it will probably be very similar to what we've done tonight. We'll allow public input. We'll try to have people only bring new things forward. Uh, we, we hear and understand what you've said. Some of us have heard it more than once. Uh, but this will give you a chance to be before and watch the process of both boards together again. So. Thank you all. I really appreciate everyone who's come and spoke tonight. I appreciate the ZBA coming and putting up with an extra night of this. And uh, we will see you all on September 15th. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, just for the record, we're adjourned.